And we're live. Welcome back to the Environment and Transportation Committee. I'm the chairman, Kumar Barbe. I'm joined by my highly efficient vice chairman, Dana Stein, and the very attentive uh, and friendly, for the most part, members of my committee. Don't test their patients. No, I'm just joking. Anyway, here's the order of the bills. We're going to take two bills from uh, Delegate Doug. Uh, uh, Robin Grammer, House Bill 500 and 621. Then we're going to House Bill 507, Delegates Proctor and Corman. House Bill 558, Delegate Clark. House Bill 593, uh, two, two bills from Delegate Jacobs, 593 and 601. Delegate um, uh, House Bill 595, Delegate Mangione. House Bill 653, Delegate Love and Boyce, who are both going to be testifying. And we will wind up the afternoon with uh, House Bill 673, Delegate Hartman, yet another example of agro-tourism in our state. Gotta love it. So let's start off with uh, House Bill 500, Delegate Grammer. Welcome to the Environment and Transportation Committee. You have four minutes. The timer will run two and two. Thank Go. you so much. Thanks so much. It's great to be back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee. For the record, Delegate Robin Grammer here to present House Bill 500. The Department of Natural Resources is directed. Department of Natural Resources is directed to pursue options to increase the productivity or utility of oyster resources under Natural Resources Article 4-1103. In 2009, the General Assembly requested that steps to be taken to dredge Manowar Shoal to facilitate that capacity. Since that time, the dredging has been debated and contested. This bill prohibits the dredging of Manowar Shoal and the execution of the Natural Resources Article. There's a simple article, or there's a simple argument for not destroying our natural resources for the purpose of maintaining oyster populations. And that is, we know these shells, once dredged, degrade in six to seven years. If we start this now, we will never see the end to the dredging of our resources for the purpose of sustaining populations. Once these resources are gone, they will never come back. They're gone permanently. And although not productive, Manowar Shoal is a part of our wildlife habitats of the Chesapeake Bay. From 1960 to 2006, hundreds of millions of bushels of buried oyster shells were dredged from the upper bay to facilitate the purpose uh, that dredging of Manor War Shoal would facilitate. When the supply was exhausted, the program ended, but our problems persist. And here we are looking to, looking to destroy more of our natural resources. The Manor War Shoal should be protected. Uh, it won't be a long-term uh, solution to the problem. And, I, and I, I, I will say sincerely, uh, you know, many of my family were watermen. I, I sympathize with the problems that the watermen face, uh, but I personally don't don't see the, the dredging of man of war or any shoal as a long-term solution to, to the problem. And uh, I hope we can protect a cherished natural resource by passing this bill. With that, I'd be happy to take questions and ask for a favorable on House Bill 500. Okay, let's go to all the advocates and then we'll entertain questions. So the next- Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I could step in for just a moment, I want to make an apology on uh, the timer mix up. We're now going to be using the, the regular timer again. It's back as one of the Zoom members. Okay, excellent. Um, all right. Um, Allison Colden with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Welcome back to the committee. You have two minutes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Dr. Allison Colden, the Maryland Senior Fisheries Scientist for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Here today in support of House Bill 500, a bill which would protect Manowar Shoal, which is located in Baltimore County near the mouth of the Patapsco River. As you heard, Manowar Shoal is the last remaining relic three-dimensional oyster reef in the upper Chesapeake Bay. Manowar Shoal once supported a robust oyster population and currently serves as critically important fish habitat for several commercial and recreational fish species. Proponents of dredging at Manowar Shoals cite falling oyster numbers throughout the bay as a need to remove shell to place in other areas. However, the limited short-term shell availability is unlikely to provide any significant benefit and is outweighed by the adverse effect on fish habitat. Habitat at Manowar Shoal remains critically important for species such as American eel, shad, bluefish, croaker, river herring, striped bass, summer flounder, blue crab, spot, and weakfish. 
Annual trawl surveys in the area on and around Van of War Shoal have documented 38 different species in the vicinity of the shoal. Instead of repeating methods of the past, we should focus on viable and durable solutions. The use of alternative substrates other than shell is proving to be highly effective and affordable in both restoration areas and harvest bottom. Reclamation of shell from previous projects can be further explored, and at this price point, importing shell from other states is also an option. Given the efficacy of alternative substrates, the irreversible impacts of this project to fish habitat, CBF believes the dredging of the last remaining three-dimensional oyster reef in the upper Chesapeake Bay is short-sighted and ill-advised. And for these reasons, we urge your favorable report on House Bill 500. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Larry Jennings. Um, Larry, welcome back to the committee. You've got two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Barve and members of the committee. I'm Larry Jennings with Coastal Conservation Association, Maryland. And we also um, want this bill passed because of the critical changes that have happened in the Upper Bay. Um, in our written testimony, you can see that this um, volume of shell that was taken out of the Upper Bay and it was many large areas of reefs, man of war shell was left because it was the smallest area and least likely to uh, produce uh, that much shell. They had studied it and uh, while it might've been the next step, the program had did abominably. As you can see, we moved the equivalent of the volume of the Houston Astrodome six times over those 46 years. The public expense at that was tremendous, but more importantly, the destruction of great habitat in the upper bay is gone forever and replaced by soft, silty mud bottom. It's not good for fishing, it's not good for minnows, it's not good for worms, and all the other animals like uh, mussels, uh, barnacles, all these other things that bring life to an oyster reef cannot inhabit these areas at all. So we've degraded this area tremendously uh, with that volume of shell. But more importantly, Langenfelder, who I knew uh, at the time, was complaining that they couldn't find concentrations of shell, that it was taking too much time and effort to find what little shell they could still dredge up. This is important habitat around the Upper Bay, and it was used to support hundreds of charter boats and thousands of people fishing. We still have huge volumes of fishermen in this state, and it is a critical resource closest to our largest city in the state. For these reasons, we strongly urge you to pass this bill and protect Man and War Shoal throughout our rest of our lifetimes. Thank you. Okay, uh, it appears that we have so far one question for the sponsor and advocates, uh, Delegate Ruth. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I, I just wondered if you could explain, because um, this is an area I don't really know much about, what, what the reason is that they want to dredge it. I, I'm not quite sure understanding what the problem is and why the dredging is supposedly being done. I could take that one or you could take that one, Larry, whichever you feel. I can take it. It, uh, it is because they, we had the shell program, the repletion program that uh, began dredging in 1962 and continued through 2006. During that 46 years of public expense to improve the oyster fishery, the harvest moved from a million and a half bushels when it started to 26,000 bushels in 2004. 46 years of taxpayer expense, and we reduced the oyster harvest 98%. Nothing has changed that kind of metric that will have any hope that man war, the little bit of shell in man of war shell will make a difference in the future of oysters. Thank you. So the dredging is supposedly to help the oysters, and but it's not, is that? That's correct. because as the repletion program was run, watermen's were, you, were paid to use their boats to move the shell around to different areas. And it was those paychecks that were critical apart to the uh, success or, or the, from the watermen's viewpoint, the success of the program, because they were able to earn other money off of the uh, public, re, uh, public funding uh, to produce this program that 
did not work then and has far less chance of working now. Okay, thank you so much. And I, I am getting a lot of emails in support of this bill. Okay, next question goes to uh, the vice chairman of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess this is for the sponsor or, or Larry um, or Allison. Um, I know when we've heard this bill in the past, one of the arguments against it is that the proposed dredging, the, uh, the permit application that was being considered would, would require a limited amount of uh, collection of shell. I think it was no more than 5 million. And then there would have to be a report back on the impacts uh, to man of war shoals and any fisher, any you know adjacent fisheries uh, before proceeding further. So basically the, the, the argument against the bill was there are these guardrails built in to make sure that impact is minimized. So do you have a response to that? Probably I'll, I'll, Allison Best. I'll, I'll stay briefly and then Larry, you can respond if you like. Um, you know, I, I, I think it sounds reasonable, but I think you have to consider the issue and the bigger scope of the problem. You know, we, we've already dredged the upper bay. Um, a lot of those resources that we dredged uh, between 1960 and 2006 are gone. And, you know, the argument that we're going to put rails around this and then we're going to get feedback and consider it going forward. To me, I mean, the bigger issue is that the, the program has not succeeded uh, thus far. Uh, if we're looking for a long-term fix for the problem, uh, you know, I, I do think if we were to dredge the shell, uh, it is a usable resource temporarily. Um, but I think that the plan itself has proven out that this is not a viable long-term solution. Uh, and I know we talk about man of war a lot, but I think we should consider you know, if we're to keep dredging up all our resources, um, or what happened in the upper bay is going to happen all over the place. And as soon as we dredge 5% on man of war, uh, it's going to be, well, we, we would like three more percent or 12 more percent or five, more. you know, it, it, when does it end? Um, so just for me, looking at the totality of, of the dredging as it's moved so far, uh, I think we, the, 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 the bounds, the guardrails have already been explored and it's just not proven to be an effective program. Mr. Vice Chair, if I could add one quick um, comment to that with respect sure. to the monitoring program that's currently outlined in the permit application that's before the Board of Public Works, CBF has provided comments and concerns to the Title Wetlands Administrators and Board about the inadequacy of that monitoring program being able to detect um, negative impacts uh, to the ecosystem because of the way that that monitoring program is designed. So we have concerns that even though there is a monitoring program um, and a, a two-step process as you put forward in the permit application, that as designed, um, those sampling protocols would not be able to detect the type of negative impacts that we expect might result from this project. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, Dana, do you have a follow-up or are you good? No, I'm, I'm good, thank you. Okay, next question goes to Delegate Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, um, the, the information submitted by DNR on this legislation that, that talks in depth about the, the uh, safety provisions in the, in the, uh, in the project, uh, I think is sort of what uh, Dr. Uh, Colton was just talking about. Uh, it points out that this total dredging uh, in, that's proposed in this project is 5%, uh, estimated 5% um, of the project. And then the, the, the safeties that are built into this are unprecedented. When you look at, once they make one cut, um, you know, this, the uh, inspection that goes into those after that cut is made, um, you know, it's a, a total of 10 cuts, about 32 acres out of 450 acres, which I think is really a small amount, whereas it, it would have make such a huge impact in producing oysters in, in uh, other parts of the bay. It would it certainly would would have an, an effect that that could produce uh, really good environmental results, you know, with the oysters uh, filtering the water and the pollution from the upper bay that comes across my favorite spot, the Conowingo, 
and uh, in other places. We have Baltimore City that's a perpetual uh, leaker of raw sewage and uh, and the Conwingo. So to get these oyster shells out, make them grow into to a, a, a oyster that can actually filter some of this water and do some good and and perhaps even be uh, uh, a monetary value to the oysterman, I think is all good for a 5% uh, cut of the uh, oysters that are currently on that bar. And secondly, I, I do have a couple questions for Dr. Colton on the statements she made in her testimony. Um, well, well, hold on, before you do those questions, would somebody like to address the whole issue of it's worth it to relocate the shells because they'll do good elsewhere? Does any you know? Does anybody want to address that before Delegate Jacobs gets to his more specific questions? Uh, I'll take a brief stab. So you know, a lot of the, there are short term benefits here. There are no um, arguments to that. And if I could give you. 2,000 acres of productive oyster capacity would be a major benefit to the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, consider this question though, what if you went back to 1960 when we started to dredge uh, the upper bay initially? And what if I told you, you know, this is gonna work for a while, but it's not gonna be a long-term solution and we're gonna need to dredge more and more and more. Um, should we dredge the upper bay knowing that? You know, and that, that's the same question you have to consider now. If it didn't work for the first 46 year period, you know, is the question right now any different? We, we dredged this 5%, which, you know, I don't, I, I have faith that they would do it within, you know, this is a, a, the most safe way they could. And they would produce a short term benefit um, for both the watermen and the, and the oyster populations. But where are we going here? You know, like I said previously, it's five now then what? Uh, and I think you should consider the short-term implications to Man of War Shoal, which is a part of the wildlife habitat for, um, for the bay. Uh, not only is it, do, do wildlife live there, like, you know, recreational fishermen, that's a big resource for them. Uh, so that's the, I, I hate to repeat myself, but I think that's the, the main crux of the question here is in the long-term does the destruction of our natural resources suit our needs? Okay, Jay, you had other more specific questions. Why don't you yeah, go to those? Um, well, uh, Dr. Colton made a couple of statements I thought were pretty interesting. And one was to about exploring imp importing from out of state. Um, you know, what has not been mentioned thus far in this hearing is the introduction of Dermo and MSX to the Bay, which destroyed the oyster population. So you want to know what destroyed the oyster population? It was Dermo and MSX, and that came from out of state. So I'd like uh, uh, to know what uh, importing from out of state, what, what does that mean, Dr. Colton, when certainly we, we have put, we put the entire oyster industry in peril when those oysters were brought in from Puget Sound that, that uh, contained Dermo and MSX years ago, back in the, many years ago, which is in the middle of all this uh, time frame that you claim that the, that the oysters went to pretty much wiped out. Well, thank you for the question, Delegate. Obviously, um, I hope we have learned a lot in the time since the 1940s and 50s with respect to shellfish sanitation. And right now, in order to import any shellfish products from out of state, even within the Chesapeake Bay, even from Virginia, there are permits that are required by the Department of Natural Resources, which test for various types of diseases to ensure that we are not transporting those types of things across state lines, because most certainly that is not something that we would like to do. We would not like to introduce any new diseases into the Chesapeake Bay. So there are currently shellfish sanitation guidelines for both live animals and shell. Um, that the Department of Natural Resources requires anyone, either the state um, or any um, organization importing any type of shellfish material or shell across state lines has to apply for and have that <clears throat> permit approved for those biosecurity purposes. Well, that in, a, in a perfect world, I agree with you, but you know, 
when those freight trains came out of Florida with that fossil shell on them, there wasn't a whole lot of inspecting going on when it got dumped into Harris Creek. You know, they weren't, the, it wasn't the size it was supposed to be. It wasn't, you know, who knows what was in those containers. And that, that area was also uh, contained derma and MSX. Uh, you know, we had some of that uh, in that, in Harris Creek when that was first planted, but it's very concerning to the waterman's world when you bring product in from out of state. It really is, you know, we have seen the devastating results of that. And that's why there's always a, a, a wish to use natural oyster shells from Maryland to do these planting projects. There's nothing better. You can't argue the fact that it's not the best. And if it comes out of Maryland and stays in Maryland, I think we're protecting ourselves and, and also protecting the bay and producing something that will help clean the water for, for many years to come. But I don't want to keep going, Mr. Chairman, because I could go for a while. But the other statement is, uh, you said reclamation should be explored further. Could you tell me what that meant? Yeah, so by shell reclamation, I'm referring to um, the possibility of shallowly buried shell from previous plantings and harvest locations. Uh, the 2009 study from the Oyster Advisory Commission, which was one that recommended um, the Man of War Shoal permit, also said that uh, the Department of Natural Resources should explore all other possible sources of shell, including shell reclamation. So I wanted to reiterate that there are other uh, possible sources of shallowly buried shell, which don't require the type of destructive buried shell dredging that is being proposed in the Manowar Shoal project. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Colden. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll cut it off for now. Okay, uh, Delegate Gilchrist has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The fiscal note says that U.S. Army Corps of Engineers provided some sort of preliminary permit in 2018. Does that permit have an expiration date? You know, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that question. The, the, the feeling, just the feeling that I get is no, uh, because I continually hear that, well, it could be put on back on the Board of Public Works, but uh, since that's knowable, I'll, um, I'll look into that and see if I could get you that information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, Delegate Gilchrist, I do know that uh, there is technically no uh, time limit on that permit, but certainly the cost increases will be there. And when you look at the $49 million we spent in the 46 years previously, the price increases from 62 to now is almost 10 times as expensive. And this estimate for Man of War Shoal is at $35 million six years ago or five years ago, whatever it was. So it's certainly okay. going to be an incredibly large expense for a very small amount of shell. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, we have no further questions for the proponents. Let's go to the testimony of the opponents and we will start with Robert T. Brown. Robert, welcome back to the committee. You got two minutes. Robert T. Yes, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you. Okay, yes. Uh, uh, my name is Robert T. Brown. I'm president of the Maryland Waterman's Association, uh, chair and members of this committee. I'm opposed to Bill uh, 500. Uh, the public fishery, it cannot supply enough shells to re uh, replenish the bay like we needed to at this time. Uh, we got aquaculture, which Helps to, they do a little bit to it, but a lot of their shells of oysters are boxed up and shipped out of the state. So we don't get those shells back. The oyster sanctuaries, which does not produce no shells whatsoever, uses a mass majority of our shells that, are, that we get from the state of Maryland and out of Virginia. Uh, this is uh, one of the things we need. Uh, back in 2000 and uh, three in 2004 oyster season, it's true that our harvest went down to 26,000 bushels, the lowest that was ever recorded. We have rebounded from that. But how we got there was from MSX and Dermo. And it was very prevalent and it wiped out most of the oysters in the, in, in the lower part of the bay was pretty much completely wiped out. 
we've been fortunate enough that with Mother Nature, we've been able to, the lower part of the bay has is finally starting to rebuild. When you lose all your brood stock and stuff, it takes time and it has taken a lot of time. We need these shells to put in seed areas that we can plant and then have them transported to the upper part of the bay where it, when disease comes back again, it will help uh, protect the seafood industry. Uh, they, it's, uh, these uh, fresh shells that we use are good, very good, but it is not as good as a fossilized shell that comes out of the bay. The fossilized shell of the bay, if you have them on ground side by side, and we still have some from the years before that we're working on at the present time, well, I produce them about 12 to one on young oysters. Uh, we have a number of these places that we're working throughout the bay that they all have not. Left Robert, yet. if you could, Robert, if you could wrap up your testimony, the committee would appreciate it. Okay, uh, I just want to say that right now this rests with the Board of Public Works. I think they should be able to make their a decision on what they're going to do with this, and I'm asking for unfavorable on this bill. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Robert T. So we're going to go to James Mullen with the Oysterman's Show Association. James, uh, Mr. Mullen, you're welcome to the committee. You've got two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I'm opposed to this bill um, just because the simple fact that the original OAC in 2009 thoroughly vetted sites in the Bay for, for shells, for oyster restoration, aquaculture, and the oyster public fishery in the state. And we attended those meetings religiously, and um, they settled on Man of War Shoal at the time. As you know, there was a bill in, it passed the legislature, Governor O'Malley signed it, and we're still waiting for the Board of Public Works to have an up or down vote on it, or even entertain debate. And that's been 13 years, so, um, I would just ask to let's give the Board of Public Works an opportunity to vet this in their exercise for an up or down vote um, just to see where it goes, because um, we don't know. And at the same time, um, as we've heard, oyster shells are needed for restoration in sanctuaries, for the aquaculture industry and for the public fishery. And that's one of the reasons that Man of War was originally proposed by the original Oyster Advisory Commission was to meet those three goals and objectives. So uh, that's my testimony. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, next up is Chip and Cloud. Chip, welcome back to the committee. You've got two minutes. Uh, <clears throat> hello, Mr. Chair, you can hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. My name is Chip McLeod. I represent the Delmarva Fisheries Association as well as the Clean Chesapeake Coalition. Um, and let me just say a few, hit a few highlights. The best thing going for oysters right now in the Chesapeake Bay is the wild public fishery. If you look at the data and what's been reported by DNR in the recent oyster stock assessment, the wild public fishery is really doing great the way it's being managed by the fishermen. Um, we had the best spat set in the Bay, Maryland portion of the Bay in the last 37 years. And the, what spat like the best is natural clean shell. Shell matters so much. Let me say we submitted written testimony, which I hope the committee members will take a look at because importantly, it includes a 2019 industry resolution fully supportive of Man of War Shoal being a resource for shell. Um, nobody that understands the Chesapeake Bay can argue that natural shell is important for oyster propagation. Um, Man of War Shoal, interestingly, DNR has put out a list of the best bars in the state of Maryland, the best bar, oyster bar list. At the very bottom of that list, number 257, is Man of War Shoal because it's unproductive. It may be a good place to fish, but there's a lot of places in the Chesapeake Bay that are good to fish, okay? This is not about fishing. This is about the oyster industry and oysters getting more oysters in the bay, which everybody to a man and woman seems to think is important for the Bay. The resistance is almost bordering on lunacy. 2019, the General Assembly passed a law asking DNR to pursue this matter. 2022, we sit here waiting for the Board of Public Works to take action. That, that, that has been sitting there for years for political reasons. I mean, this is a prime example of how this has been politicized. Um, look what's happened in the meantime. Virginia has been dredging natural shell 
using the same dredge that we used to use. I mean, the facts are so evident. We need shell, everybody agrees. And by the way, the upper bay is a mess. There is so much dredging, industrial if you, if dredging. If you could start to wrap up your testimony, um, yes, Chip. Yes, I will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are two licensed commercial oystermen in Baltimore County. Delamarva Fisheries and on the Eastern Shore, there are 80% of the licensed commercial watermen, okay? this We can't make this about territories and somebody claiming this is an, a, a, um, a resource that shouldn't be shared by everybody. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Please look at our testimony. Okay, next we have Captain uh, Robert Newberry. Uh, you are welcome back to the committee. You have two minutes, Captain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope everybody's doing fine. Captain Rob Newberry, Chairman of Delmarva Fisheries Association. Um, I want to set the record straight. A couple of comments were made on here that were kind of ludicrous in my, uh, in my world. Uh, the comment made about shell depletes in six to seven years. Uh, last year, I went with the Department of Natural Resources down to Bay. We found deposits of shells that were planted four years ago, specifically, for, or 40 years ago, specifically from there. It does not degrade because the salinity level in the Northern Bay is, is insignificant. And to say that this program didn't work from 1960 to uh, 2006, uh, it produced, according to record, 59 million bushels of oysters and a revenue of 30, 73 million dollars. So I don't know how it went 46 million in the hole. I mean, these are records from the comptroller of the state of Maryland. Um, the dredging that goes on up there, I mean, you're making such a big issue out of not dredging Man of War Shoals. Hey, guys, what about the approach channels at Baltimore Harbor, Craig Hill 1, Craig Hill 2, Brewerton Channel, uh, the cutoff channel? I mean, we watched them dredged all year long last year. I didn't even hear any of you guys complaining about that, and the plume went clear all the way to the Bay Bridge. So Man of War Shoals is sitting there doing nothing. Uh, this bit about important fishing and all these species. Um, I fish out of Rock Hall. I fish in that area. The only thing you can catch on Man of War Shoals really is white perch and catfish. You can catch white perch in a million different places in the Chesapeake Bay, not just Man of War Shoals. And as far as saying they catch croaker and spot, I don't think a croaker has been caught north of the Bay Bridge. And I contacted all my charter boats, the head boats out of Kent Island. They haven't caught one north of the Bay Bridge in 17 years. So areas that they're, they're talking about that are so bad, you have Tea Kettle, you have the Lumps north of Tall Chester, and you also have Wharton Hole. Those are all three areas that Langenfeld are dredged. It just so happens to be on CCA's list of good places to fish. It's good habitat that they created. Their dive off points in the hot summer, it's, it goes from 18 feet to 28 to 32 feet. The fish get in there, everybody fishes in those areas. But as far as the fishing that goes on at Man of War Shoals, I'm out there almost every day and I have seen little, if any, even on reports, on the fishing reports, they don't reflect anything from Man of War. So there's 50, 150 million bushels of shell. If you could start there. to wrap it up a bit. Um... All right, I'll make it real quick. There's 150 million bushels of shell sitting up there doing nothing that could restore 15,000 acres. We only want the initial 5 million to get a start. We need shell. Let's stop this politicizing and I'll close with this comment. It is evident right now that when you politicize a natural resource, two things happen. The demise of that resource and the demise of the industry based upon it. And that's exactly what's happening. I ask for an unfavorable vote on this bill. It needs to go away. It is a waste of time. Thank you. Captain, um, thanks for testifying. I, I noticed, uh, did you steal that shirt from your wife, the working girl shirt there? Now, wait a minute. <laughs> I didn't say anything when you were eating a sandwich. No, it's my good. Uh, all right, food. fair enough. Fair right, enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Fair enough. We've got some questions. Anne Healy has the first question. Uh, and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is uh, I guess anyone who's been talking about um, the how the oysters love these shells better than anything else. For the spat for the for, for attaching and growing we, we've had in over the years testimony here that there are alternatives of concrete and other other materials that have been placed uh, where the oysters can grow and I wondered if this is just uh, whether this is you know something that is not in the experience of the oystermen or it's just they have a preference for those that grow on the shell could, could I speak to that please Yes, you can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're, we're talking about alternative substrates. Um, the 
Horn Point Laboratory and UMSEs have done studies and have found out that the specific fossilized shell from that region of man of war shells in the upper bay is anywhere from 10 to 14 times better than alternative substrate. Now you're talking about putting concrete and other issues into the bay. Um, the last time I checked, I don't think the bay is a rubble dump. And that's my opinion on this. There are concerns from the EPA on bridge deck use and concrete that contain high levels of PCBs that have to be addressed. But the bottom line is we're bringing in a material into the bay that doesn't exist, not naturally. So shell is the only answer. And that basically the Langenfelder shell, any waterman or any laboratory <clears throat> or any hatchery will tell you that is by far the best known to man. And you can't, I mean, you can strike oysters on golf balls, but you know, we're not making a $20 million order to title us to put golf balls in the bay either. Thank you very much. Okay, next question goes to Delegate Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we occasionally go out on, uh, on boats and we watch shell get dropped over and there's spat on that shell and it gets dropped over into the bay. But I've heard that, that that's actually a relatively new technology like in the last 15 years that we've been able to put the spat on the shell and do that. Do I have that right? Yes. When did that start? I mean, it, it started years and years ago, but um, I mean, I will, def can I defer this to uh, Mr. Brown because he is in that industry and he can be a little bit more specific, but it is, it's not relatively new, but I'll turn this one over to you, Robert. Tick. Sure. Uh, yes. Uh, this is fairly new. I've started into it probably about 12, 15 years ago. Uh, I didn't know how much success I was going to have with it at first because it was all new. And I tried it and it's been very successful. Uh, it's, you, you've got to have, you, we've got shell. We take it, wash the shells. We put them in to the tanks. And uh, we go over to, I get my, most of my lorry, just about all of it from a Horns Point. And you get uh, like 4 million uh, larvae, which is a little bit bigger than a golf ball. And uh, we put it in the tanks. We, we give air to it. Of course, we've already checked the salinity and checked the water temperature. If the water's not hot enough, we got heaters that heat it up. And we get it up around 80 degrees. And the salinity has got to be at least eight. I like to keep mine at around nine to half, 10. And uh, leave it in there for three days. Then you tear turn your air on to it, not oxygen, just plain air. You've already had circulating through there. In three days, you turn water on out the creek. Uh, at, at three days before you turn the water on, you can look down in the tanks and you can see the bottom there like uh, four foot deep. And it's because they've eaten all the algae out of the tank and we have to feed them. And we feed them for about another four or five days. All right. And then a sample's taken and goes to a horn's point. And uh, right. they, they count the larvae on it because it's so small you can't see it. Uh, with your eyes, you got spat that is set on in by then. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, one thing I will add is uh, we did a big project up on Swarm Point, which uh, went through legislation to uh, make it a test area for, for uh, doing this, and it came out to be very successful. Thank you. Okay, there appear to be no further questions for the opponents. And with that, we will end the public hearing on uh, House Bill 500. Let's turn next to um, House Bill 621, also Delegate Grammar. This is a uh, statewide bill that has to do with effluent discharges. Uh, so go ahead, Delegate Gr uh, Grammar. you have four minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Delegate Robin Grammer here to present House Bill 621. House Bill 621 puts in place a framework for monitoring, evaluation, and inspections at sewage treatment plants. We have sponsored a similar bill for several years and this committee has moved that bill. This bill is a bit different and I want to explore why. To do that, I'd like to speak to the magnitude of the problems we are seeing in Southeastern Baltimore County. For nearly a hundred years, illegal releases at the Back River treatment plant have been litigated in the courts. The state and the federal government have sued Baltimore City who currently acts under a consent decree for management issues. Additionally, the state and the federal government have also subsidized capital improvements to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars as a long-term fix to address these illegal releases. The releases and the consequences continue. One consequence of the effluent release is the chronic midge issues 
suffered by the communities surrounding Back River, which deal with clouds of millions of midges when they step outside of their homes. In 2021, uh, 2020 and 2021, this committee moved a very similar bill, uh, which sought to put in place monitoring of effluents released at the Back River treatment plant. Those bills failed in the Senate. When I returned home after the 2021 session, we were hit with the worst bout of midges I've seen in my entire life. The only way to describe it is biblical. Both the Essex and the Edgemere peninsulas were covered in midges. You could look up from any point in the area at giant black clouds of tiny bugs. There were parts of Back River where there were so many midges coming from the water that the water churned if there was a boat motor running. In June, the Department of Natural Resources, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of the Environment held a conference call with representatives from southeastern Baltimore County, including myself. And the ultimate result of the call was combined efforts of the state and Baltimore County to put in place a midge, eradica a midge eradication program using BTI. It was found that several months later, the Blue Water Baltimore had triggered audits at several local wastewater treatment plants who were found to be massively in violation of permitted releases. No representative of Southeastern Baltimore County was made aware of this. The first time we heard about it was via the news release. The problems that residents describe as, quote, the worst midge infestation they had seen in 20 years was more than likely due to chronic and unreported failures at the plant. The Department of the Environment has subsequently sued the city, but what needs to be said is that the Department of the Environment has also failed in its monitoring. The representatives from southeastern Baltimore County have asked for monitoring of these releases for years to, to get some kind of indication on the, the, their impact on midge, uh, uh, the populations of midges in Back River. The department has done nothing to accomplish this and has stood silent as we have suffered the worst infractions that we have witnessed in decades. For that reason, I ask that we put in place prudent monitoring requirements to address a problem that has existed for over 100 years. With that, I'll be happy to take questions, and I'd ask for a favorable report on House Bill 621. Yeah, I'll just, um, again, emphasize this is a statewide bill. No local letter of is required from any delegation it's statewide. Any questions on this? I, I believe no one else is signed up to present oral testimony, everything else is written. So um, any questions for the sponsor? And there are no opponents. Okay, Delegate Grammer, uh, thank you very much. It looks like there are no questions. You're free to go. Thank you so much. Okay. Next, let's turn to House Bill 507. Uh, Delegate Proctor, are you in the House? Uh, Delegate Proctor? Is she here? Uh, the office is on the call, but they're not unmuting. Uh, okay, we'll wait for a second for Delegate Proctor to unmute and testify. Hi, she's she will be right with us, okay? Uh, okay. She just has to move from one desk to the other. Okay. As long as she's not at the baggage claim at BWI and uh, planning to drive in. I see Delegate Silberti mute, uh, mu muttering, but he's tactfully muted himself. Okay, here's uh, Delegate Susie Proctor. Susie, welcome back to the committee. You've got four minutes. The timer will go through two minutes, two times. Am I up at this time? Am I good? Yeah, you're good. We can see and hear you. Okay. Well, good afternoon, Chair Barbe, uh, Vice Chair, and members of the House Environmental and Transportation Committee. My name is Susie Proctor. I'm here today in support of House Bill 507, uh, Electric Vehicle Charging Infrastructure Environmental Justice Consideration. Uh, the purpose of 50, House Bill 507 is to ensure that environmental justice guidelines be part of the decision metrics for any state funded development of electrical, electric vehicle uh, charging stations. Environmental justice guidelines should be one of the criteria used in setting decisions which will ensure 
that low income and disadvantaged communities receive their fair share of state funded infrastructure projects. In a survey of uh, public charging stations across Maryland, there's a stark disparity in, in each of the neighborhoods. For example, Charge Hub, an electric charging station clearinghouse, indicates that there are 79 charging stations in Bethesda and 15 in, in Waldorf, or 45 in Bowie and one in La Plata. Ensuring the application of environmental justice guidelines as one of the criteria for any state funded development of electric vehicle charging stations is particularly timely. The federal infrastructure uh, package allocated $7.5 billion to the states for the installation of new charging stations. This legislation with the assistance of and input, input from the State Commission on Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities will help guide Maryland to make decisions that will use our money equitably. The importance of charging station and charging station equity was echoed by Vice President Harris when she visited Brandywine, Maryland this past December to promote the in infrastructure bill. One of the largest impediments to a greater embrace of electric vehicles is no longer just about the cost of a car. It's about how to get charging vehicles where there is no access to home base charging stations. In conclusion, this legislation represents an important step to make sure that all, com all communities can participate in the economy of the future. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to try to answer your questions. Well, thank you. Well, let's go through, I think only one person has I'm signed up. Excuse me? Uh, okay, I think only one person has signed up to testify in favor of the bill, and no one is opposed. So I'll uh, I'll uh, recognize Andrew Frazier back to the committee. Andrew, you're uh, Hello. welcome back. You got two Thank minutes. You. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Barbe and um, committee. Um, I think this is uh, important. Uh, the bills are very important in order to make sure that these uh, charges are available to. Uh, everyone. Um, one of the things I, I also would like to recommend is that that um, in, in finalizing the legislation that we look at level two and level three locations, because um, in terms of, of, of charging stations, you have level two, which are considered more like destination stations where you charge for several hours or overnight. And then there, there are the ones along the highways, which are usually level three chargers. So um, I think that, that in, in passing this, that that should be a consideration uh, not to limit the ability you know, for fast charging stations along major highways, because that's where the fast charging stations will be. Um, with that, I'll end my testimony. Thank you. Okay. Um, first question is uh, from David Frazier Hidalgo. Go easy on him. <laughs> Delegate Proctor, I want to thank you for uh, for bringing this bill. You know, we often look at things, or maybe we don't enough look at things from the historical context. We're looking at the Industrial Revolution, and we look at revolutions in this in, in the kind of the history of human beings. And we're, we're in the middle of one right now with the transition to electric vehicles. And I, the the question that I had for you basically is to is that <clears throat> this is an opportunity to get environmental justice right when we haven't so many in revolutions in the in the past would you would you agree with that i certainly would i certainly would thank you thank you for the bell mm -hmm. yeah okay we also have a question from delegate ruth 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thank you, Delegate Proctor, for bringing this bill. I think environmental justice is really important, and um, you know this is, uh, this is an important consideration. I just wanted to ask if you had a chance to look at the testimony from the Maryland Energy Administration. Um, they're, they're asking for an amendment to um, exempt the um, electric vehicle charger rebate programs, um, and, and I just wondered if you had discussed that with them or had a position on that. Um, I have not had a discussion with them. I did, I did receive their letter. Um, I'm not sure, and I do have to have a discussion with them, exactly how they see these two bills um, you know, impacting one another. That seems a, a, a separate uh, entity to me, but I will be discussing it with them. Yeah, th thank you so much. I was just curious. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. That ends the public, I, I think nobody's, yeah, nobody else is testifying. That ends the public hearing on House Bill 507. Let's proceed to House Bill 558, Delegate Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the bill I have for you today, uh, for the record, uh, Delegate Jerry Clark, uh, Calvert and St. Mary's uh, here to uh, present uh, HB 588. Uh, as we know, over the last few years, we've been going through a pandemic of, uh, of uh, biblical proportions that we've never experienced before. So one of the things that uh, it seems to have done is it has uh, encouraged families and individuals to to try to spend more time outside in nature rather than uh, being able to go to indoor uh, facilities and places where you have large crowds. So one of the things that has uh, uh, come from that and has spawned itself in that is the uh, uh, camping industry. Uh, so the bill I have for you today is basically just enabling legislation, enabling legislation for each jurisdiction to include in the definition of, agri of um, agricultural tourism the uh, ability to um, allow for camping and incidental, uh, incidental stays, just like overnight stays in uh, ag tourism products. Uh, it was brought to me just uh, a few weeks ago, and I was asked to, uh, to put this in to change this definition. Again, all the regulations and all the uh, major parts of this would be done locally. Uh, it just adds this definition to the, uh, to the uh, agritourism uh, regulation, and the local jurisdictions would be able to either embrace it or not embrace it. Uh, and then to set all their own uh, regulations for that. Uh, we have some people to testify today that are, that are experiencing, experienced and working on this uh, premise now and have done this in some other areas and they have a lot of information. They'll probably be able to answer a lot of your questions with their testimony. Uh, having said that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would ask for a favorable uh, um, recommendation for this bill. Okay, let's go through the proponents. And there is one, when I guess the one person who's opposed uh, has written testimony. So we'll go through the proponents. Oh, one, 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 other, one other real quick thing, if I may. Oh, sure. I believe this bill, there was a cross file on this bill in the Senate, and I believe it's already passed the Senate uh, 45 to nothing, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so we know at least there are 45 people who don't read bills in the Senate, right? Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jeremy, uh, uh, Jeremy Willett, uh, you're next up. You have two minutes. So thank you so much. Um, my name is Jeremy, and I'm a fourth generation farm owner in Carroll County, Maryland. And when I was a teenager, I watched as our family farm was actually sold outside of our family. And one of the first things that the new owner did was put a gate with a lock uh, on a fence at the end of our farm lane. And so it was always my dream to buy back the farm. And in 2017, that dream became a reality. And that's now where I'm raising my family, including our two kids. 
Um, as you can imagine, we immediately began to look for ways to diversify our income. And so in 2019, we started using a, a mobile app-based platform called HipCamp, which is like Airbnb for camping. And in our very first year, we hosted over 200 guests from nine different states and two different countries. Um, we now average approximately $250 to $500 per week from camping reservations. We've also seen a dramatic increase in our sales of things that we produce right here on our farm, including free range eggs, meat, flowers, et cetera, um, direct to our camping guests. And in addition, we created a local guide because our local businesses that surround the farm absolutely love this because they see their revenue increase as our guests go and patronize their businesses. Um, and then finally, uh, just this week, our county, Carroll County, did a front page article about camping on farms and their support of agritourism. And this is um, our farm here on the front. So we were really thankful to see that local support. And I tell you all of these things because the very first thing that we did as a family when we bought back the farm in 2017 was take off the gate and the lock and open it up, signaling to our neighbors that they are welcome here and that we really desire to welcome urban and rural environments and communities to come together on our farm to experience the great outdoors. And that's why we support the proposed revision to the agritourism definition. Thank you so much. Great, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll go to Mason Smith. Hi everyone, thank you, Mr. Chairman and esteemed members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to offer comments on this important issue. My name is Mason Smith and I lead government relations for HIPCAMP and we encourage the committee to give the bill a favorable report. As Jeremy mentioned, HIPCAMP is a website and an app that allows farmers and other local landowners to rent campsites, RV spots and other structures on their land to travelers. Landowners or hosts like Jeremy, as we call them, set their availability, set their prices and keep 90% of what their campers pay. Last year alone, HipCamp hosts earn more than $31 million through our website. The proposed revisions to the definition of agritourism would more easily allow farmers across Maryland to welcome campers to their land. And this is beneficial in three main ways. First, camping provides an innovative and diverse revenue stream for Maryland farmers. And with the rising cost of land, water, and other agricultural inputs, farmers need every opportunity to develop new revenue streams. Camping represents a massive opportunity to keep working lands working. Secondly, as Jeremy also suggested, camping on farms supports small businesses and creates jobs. So during an average visit, each camper who travels through our platform spends about $300 at local restaurants, gear shops, farm stands, and more. And this spending provides sustainable revenue for small businesses and creates jobs in the local community. And finally, Camping is a family-friendly activity that can promote and grow the state's agricultural heritage. Overnight stays on farms directly expose people, including and especially children, to agricultural lands and lifestyles. Defining agritourism to include camping will make it easier to introduce the state's next generation of farmers to working lands. Making camping and other incidental outdoor stays more accessible to rural landowners will safeguard two of the state's signature industries agriculture and tourism. Again, we encourage the committee to give the bill a favorable report and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Colby Ferguson. Colby, wel welcome back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, M Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Allen Farm Bureau. And I apologize if I end up having some, some noise behind me, but I'm doing my very first in the Senate uh, in, in person uh, hearings as well as uh, here in the Zoom. So I'm in some cubicle here in the Senate office building. So uh, we support this bill. Um, this is a, a bill that uh, we believe uh, uh, cleans up some land. It really doesn't do anything to the local uh, regulations. It just basically fixes um, some enabling legislation to include camping uh, in our agritourism definition that we passed a few years ago. Uh, it does not require the counties to adopt anything. Um, if they so choose, then they can move forward. I will say Charles County has actually already adopted the uh, farm camping into their agritourism definition. So uh, we think this is a good bill. I think you've heard from Jeremy and, and Mason did a good job and 
And as Delga Clark said, uh, this is enabling legislation. It does not require the counties to do anything. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Delegate Boyce has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, my, one of my favorite delegates, uh, Delegate Clark. Um, I wanted to talk about AIA's um, letter of opposition um, and that uh, I think they're worried and I understand that this is enabling. So I'm just a little confused about why they are concerned about the definition of camping being too um, being too general. Um, can someone uh, speak to that just a little bit? Uh, uh, Delegate, uh, my answer to that question is I didn't receive their uh, um, their objection until just in the last day or so. Oh. And, and I do know that in the Senate bill there was they didn't put any unfavorable. Uh, uh, testimony into the Senate bill. So they may not have seen the Senate bill or realized it was there. So I, I can't really uh, uh, speak to it too much. Maybe one of the other gentlemen that testified could, but uh, I've had no conversations with them. Okay. Um, Delegate, um, I, I saw the, uh, the, the information that they, they, that they sent in. I actually talked to one of their lobbyists um, actually before the Senate version and thought we had uh, kind of made it clear uh, that this bill does not force anything. It doesn't create um, some large campgrounds, no KOAs, anything like that. It still, still gives the authority to the counties to regulate um, size, scale, limitations. I know in Carroll County, they're very, very limited that they can only do two or three campsites. Um, they're limited to the to the the duration of stay. Um, so yeah, I think what the, where, where I read, I don't see how that this bill uh, affects that at all. Uh, I just want to be clear. It looks like they've misinterpreted the bill, and that a local jurisdiction, for instance, Baltimore City, could decide that this can only happen on urban farms in the city or something like that, or not, a, or not even at all, or not or even. Maybe, at all. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, oh, we have Jim Gilchrist asking a question. Go ahead, uh, Delegate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So currently, are campgrounds licensed or permitted in the state? Um, their camp campgrounds are pre predominantly, um, they're zoned in the counties as far as like a um, office of tourism requirement for a permit. I, I don't know on that question, but I do know within the counties for any campgrounds that are on park, on park ground or KOAs, they, they are permitted and, um, um, receive a cert certain jurisdiction within the, uh, the zoning, uh, county by county. But as far as a state permit that, that I don't know. So any county that wanted to take a advantage of this enabling legislation, they would have experience permitting campgrounds? Yeah, I would think, oh, go ahead. Delegate. I was just gonna say, not necessarily, but uh, they would have the ability to, uh, uh, this just enables them with the ability to uh, do the research and set up um, you know, the, the regulations and the ordinances that they felt that were the proper ones. For this to be done on uh, ag land. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. More questions, Delegate Healy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm curious about how this actually works. I want to ask the farmer who's already doing this on his farm. Did you have to put in um, septics or uh, electrical or plumbing to accommodate the campers, or is this like just straight out? pitch a tent in the yard kind of camping. Thank you for your question, Delegate. Um, we designate a specific location on our farm that has like a picnic table, a little fire pit. We provide campfire wood, and then we rent a porta pot from a local company that they professionally service that every single week. And um, we worked directly with our local health department to make sure that, they, that we were satisfying any needs that they had at the county level. Um, so then our guests, they bring their own tent or RV and are self-contained within that for their lodging. And do, do you have electrical hookups or anything like that for them? Uh, we do not, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Delegate Terraza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, I th think that camping sounds really cool. 
Um, but you said a magical wording, word zoning, and that uh, sort of woke me up to this um, for a second. Do zone do counties have zoning that refers to agritourism? So, in other words, their zoning regulations say you can do things that are defined as agritourism on this land. And so this is going to automatically allow for, I'm not sure that's a bad thing. I don't know whether it's a good thing or bad thing, but I'm just wondering if this is gonna automatically allow camping on land that is now zoned for agritourism. Not, not, not unless the county adopts it. I mean, you don't have to be, to, to allow this. All this will do is put that definition in agritourism and gives the counties the ability to do the research to allow it on their ag properties that qualify for the ag tourism. Uh, they will be able to set what, what infrastructure needs to be on that piece of property or, or that uh, ag, uh, ag property to be able to to do this campsite and uh, we'll be able to control it. So yeah. no, it wouldn't open, it wouldn't create a new zoning you know, or it's just it just adds to the definition of agri agritourism. Well I, I, no thank you um delegate clerk I appreciate that and I know that's not your intent but if if let's say Howard County code says on z land zoned RR you're allowed to do things that are defined as agritourism. And we're changing the definition of agritourism. By definition, you're now allowed to do camping on that land. I'm not suggesting that's a bad thing. I don't really yeah, have an opinion be, that about would... that other than to think this sounds really neat. And I'm really happy for Mr. Will that he's doing something that he's so passionate about and sounds really cool. So yeah. I'm not uh, expressing opinion one way or another, but I'm just wondering if we're opening that up and maybe the subcommittee can just take a look at that issue. Well, that that would be up to Howard County because this is just a, enabling legislation that gives them the ability to allow it if they choose to. Okay. They Thank don't you. have to do it. Yeah, uh, Howard County, as of right now, specifically for Howard County, they do not have this in their definition. So they would have to, if they decided they wanted to, they would have to come in and adopt um, regulation to allow this. They would have to put it into their zoning, number one, and then they could couch it or, or put it in saying that we're gonna allow it, but only two spots, only this time of year uh, with these certain requirements. So there's nothing, there's nothing preemptive to this bill. Um, the county, even if you have an agritourism definition, which all 23 counties do, oh, they, um, have, they would have to add this, they would have to include this in, just so, like we're doing. So Mr. Ferguson, th that's helpful. The, so the counties don't refer to the state definition of agritourism, they have their own definitions of agritourism, is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. And so a lot of counties will look at the state for reference. And that's why we put the bill in is this, this bill and a bill here um, later are doing the same thing. It's just for reference. So, the, so just for the subcommittee to, to just, I would just make sure though that they don't adopt this definition by reference so that they, this just have, I guess all I'm trying to figure out is whether the counties will have this as a surprise in their code is what I'm trying to make sure. Again, not expressing anything against having that in their code. I'm just wondering if we're changing something that will impact county zoning law without having them take a further step. But I thank you for your answers and appreciate your um, additional information there. Okay, next question goes to Delegate Boyce. Uh, thank you, and uh, Delegate um, Clark just touched on something that I that I wanted to touch on is there is I, I I forgot I saw this there is another bill just like yours same name can you tell us what the differences are I, I you... haven't I haven't looked at the other bill uh, Kobe can you uh, address that Yeah I'm I'll be testifying on it here in a little bit too so. Uh, the difference between the two bills is this bill is adding far as adding camping and incidental outdoor stays to the de state definition of agritourism. Uh, Delegate Hartman's bill that's coming up um, adds um, special events to 
the definition. So again, another enabling legislation, uh, but it, it targets special events. So that would be, um, you know, if, you want, if, if a farmer has a big bank barn and wants to allow, um, um, you know, corporate events or something like that to come in, wants to allow the, 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 the legislature to come in and do a farm tour, they can use that facility, that type of mentality. Okay, thank you so much, Colby. All right, there appear to be no further questions and the only uh, opposition was written. So that ends the public hearing on House Bill 558. Let's go to the first of Delegate Jacobs's bills, House Bill 593. Delegate Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm here today to present House Bill 593, Delegate Jacobs. Um, this is a uh, natural resources shell dredging permit application uh, piece of legislation. In 2009, a similar bill was passed, HB 103, that re required the Department of Natural Resources to apply to the Department of Environment and the Army Corps of Engineers for permits to dredge buried shell. That legislation was ultimately directed to one site, which was Man of War Shoal. Over a period of years, the study was conducted, the per permit was issued, but as of today, some 13 years later, the project has not been funded by the Board of Public Works, so the approved project yet is yet to begin producing shell. Many watermen around the entire Chesapeake Bay have asked why more sites were not considered. This is the reason why the County Oyster Committee representatives from around the state met over a period of several, several weeks, along with representatives of DNR, Maryland Watermen's Association, Maryland Oystermen's Associations, and others, to discuss and suggest additional oyster bar locations around the state that could be used and included on a list of possible dredging and buried shell for relocation for the purpose of oyster repletion. More shell has been a topic of discussion of everyone associated in the oyster industry for many, many years. On page three of the 2021 Oyster Advisory Commission's report in which there was an 80% agreement under the heading of shell and substrate resource recommendations, states that there is an important need for clean shell and substrate that will support the enhancement of all sectors of the oyster resource, including the public fishery, aquaculture, public and private restoration efforts as well. The first two bullet points under this recommendation. Number one, DNR should evaluate and develop cost-effective strategies for identifying and obtaining obtaining sources of shell and substrate. Number two, DNR should review in the current state laws and regulations to evaluate and develop potential strategies, including providing economic incentives to retain shell in the state of Maryland and reuse it. The 27 bar sites listed in HB 593 were the bars agreed to by the Oyster Committee representatives and watermen that, that submitted these to DNR for consideration. The Chesapeake Bay for the last two years has been experiencing an enormous strike on the substrate or, or on oyster shell. In fact, more than double the average strike. It's been extraordinary. Diseases are down and we should be making every effort possible to be capitalizing on these favorable conditions. All of this process takes a great deal of time to get to the point of dredging shell, and that is the reason this emergency bill seeks to get the process moving. The shell that comes from public bottom under this legislation will be returned to public bottom locations around the uh, state as determined by the County Oyster Committees and Oyster Recovery Partnerships Board of Directors. Most of that shell currently available, most of the shell currently available in Maryland is sold to back to Maryland by an out-of-state shucking house uh, because we have a lack of shucking uh, houses in Maryland. So the certainty of the shell is never a guarantee that we'll get it back. Also, the next governor may have an entire different view on the public fishery, which may also affect the decision of, out of, state, of the out-of-state seller of the shell to sell any significant amount of shell back to the state, which was evidenced during the O'Malley administration. In closing, the time is now to make every effort to take advantage of the great recruitment conditions that the state of Maryland is current, currently experiencing. Thank you. 
Thank you, Delegate. Let's go through all the witnesses who are signed up to testify in favor. We'll start with Robert T. Robert, uh, two minutes. Welcome back. Uh, Robert T. Brown, President of the Maryland Waterman Association, uh, Chairman Bar Barbe, uh, and members of the committee. Uh, we're in favor of this bill. Uh, the shell program that we got, it's not getting any better at all. I mean, uh, not we don't have the shell. And the public fishery cannot harvest enough oysters to fulfill all the needs that are of aquaculture, uh, sanctuaries, and the public fishery. The sanctuaries use a large volume of our shells. We need to have shells to place down in the lower part of the bay uh, to get our seed program going like it was years ago. And what it does, we plant the shells in the lower part of the bay, then we move it to different parts of the bay and even the upper part of the bay for when not if disease comes back, but when it comes back, we got to have a place where we can work and keep our industry going. And we just need shells. And the only thing I can say is uh, uh, we're in favor of this bill and uh, get us some shells. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, next, we'll hear from Timothy Mortis. Uh, Timothy, welcome to the committee. You've got two minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you. Hi, I'm, I'm Tim Mortis, president of the Cecil Harper Watermen's Association and second vice president of the Maryland Watermen's Association. As Robert T. stated, you know, the Shell program over the years has not gotten any better. And us up the bay would kind of like to see some more shells come around so we can do more projects like the Swan Point project that was a huge success the past, some, past couple years. And kind of bring oystering back to the upper bay, so to speak. Uh, just hope you guys give us a favorable um, outcome on this. Well, thank you. Um, next, let's go to uh, James Mullen. Uh, Mr. Mullen, uh, welcome back. You've got two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, uh, Speak in favor of the bill because it lists the potential sites for consideration that should be investigated further for potential benefits to the public oyster fishery, aquaculture, and restoration. Um, to Delegate Jacobs's point, it, it starts the discussion to explore these sites. And secondly, I had the privilege of serving on the latest OAC. Uh, you know, and with the legislative mandate, we did identify potential shell sites for consideration and to see what sites can actually be considered, you know, for further deliberation and to work with our state and federal partners on this. So really all Delegate Jacobs, in my opinion, is doing is furthering the goals and objectives of the um, leg OAC legislative mandate to further this discussion and to begin the discussion to identify these sites. And um, in closing, just to, you know, the one of the consensus recommendations we had was using bars north of the Bay Bridge as investments against disease outbreaks in the lower Bay. So um, hopefully we get a favorable report on this to begin the conversation. We've got to start somewhere and uh, because honestly, we just don't know what's going to happen with the Man of War Shoal. So we've got to continue to, to look at other sites that was discussed earlier in the previous let, uh, bill on Man of War. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you. I think that's everybody who wants to offer testimony in favor. So let's go to questions. Uh, questions. I don't see any questions, surprisingly enough. So let's go to the opponents. And I think, um, uh, yeah, okay, we'll start with Bruce Beriano. He is Bruce. not in the lobby at the moment. Okay. He'll turn up at some point, I'm sure. Allison Colden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Again, my name is Dr. Allison Colden, Maryland Fisheries Scientist with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, here in opposition today of House Bill 593. This emergency bill would require the Department of Natural Resources to apply for a dredging permit for 27 different locations throughout the Bay. 
The locations identified in this bill represent significant ecological habitats with important statutory and regulatory protections, including oyster sanctuaries, striped bass spawning reaches, and critical habitat for federally endangered Atlantic sturgeon. According to the latest stock assessment, striped bass populations are currently overfished and reproduction has been below average for the past three years, according to DNR's annual survey. This bill would direct shell dredging in several areas designated as striped bass spawning reaches where striped bass reproduction occurs and are areas as designated for special conservation actions per DNR regulations. With respect to Atlantic sturgeon, according to the Endangered Species Act of 1973, critical habitat is designated as specific areas within the geographical area occupied by the species at the time of listing that contain physical or biological features essential to the conservation of the species, in this case, shell deposits. In our written testimony, we have included a map that shows all of the areas where the proposed dredging locations in this bill overlap with these important conservation areas. Given the importance of these areas to the conservation of endangered species and species in need of conservation, shell dredging in these areas is inappropriate. Further, this bill would effectively reinstate the seed and shell program we have previously discussed today that ran from 1960 to 2006. During this time of this program, oyster abundance in Chesapeake Bay in Maryland declined 92% and habitat declined 70%. As you heard in the introduction, this bill was developed exclusively by industry members and DNR. In a few weeks time, this committee will hold a hearing on House Bill 1228, which instead builds directly upon the OAC's recommendations and provides a holistic approach to identifying shell and substrate and retaining shell in the state of Maryland. Therefore, we recommend an unfavorable report on House Bill 593. Thank you. And the final usual suspect, Larry Jennings is uh, with us to testify against. Larry, welcome back. Thank you, Chairman Barve. Again, I'm Larry Jennings with CCA Maryland and a volunteer with them. Um, this is a pretty ludicrous bill because of many of the reasons Dr. Colden cited. Uh, this is critical habitat. The upper bay has really been decimated in good fishing spots with the high uh, reefs that attract the fish uh, to get away from the mud. This would only expand where the mud is where the mud plumes would be going, and again, serve no useful benefit. I got a text from uh, Dave Sikorsky, our uh, executive director, and he said, by the way, the OAC did not agree to dredge buried shell, only shallow shell that had been placed there by previous um, um, plantings. So it is not something any, even endorsed by the OAC, and we think is, this bill is totally ridiculous. Uh, we have no need at the OAC meeting last night. Watermen were saying how great the harvest has been this, this year. They're getting by. Why? Because we're not dredging these days. We're not tearing up the bottom and creating all this mud and new silt around. So that may well have a good part of why the oyster harvest is coming back and certainly shows we, we do not start to need to expand these other areas most of which would be unusable anyway from their designations. And the other ones would be so tiny to be ridiculous to send a dredge there for, for the uh, shell they may have buried. Thank you for your time. I urge you to give this uh, bill an unfavorable report. Okay, we're, we're relatively early in the General Assembly session here. I would admonish people testifying on bills not to use term to try to avoid using terms like ludicrous and ridiculous because, you know, uh, people don't think that the things that they're introducing are ludicrous and ridiculous. And you can use a different, slightly less inflammatory adjective to describe uh, what you're trying to say. So, okay. Any questions for the opponents? Oh, Mr. Okay. Chairman, I believe we have Chip McClaude and Robert. Oh, you're right. You're right. you're right. You're uh, right. Chip McLeod. Chip, welcome yep. back to the committee. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on behalf of the Delmarva Fisheries Association and the Clean Chesapeake Coalition, just want to say um, we obviously support uh, uh, any efforts to acquire more shell and to support the public fishery, aquaculture, the sanctuaries, all of that. Uh, this bill, though, represents really not the way to manage a public fishery. 
Um, our concerns are, and why we have to oppose this bill, is there's no mention whatsoever of Man of War Shoal, and that really should be the primary focus for everybody right now. Um, DNR can do, we believe, what this bill sets out to do. I mean, here, in 2009, the General Assembly passed a law to tell the then DNR to do something about Man of War Shoal, and we're arguing about it today in 2022. So we're putting a bill in for 27 sites. I mean, where is this really gonna lead us? It's just no way to manage a fishery. Um, the list is outdated. Some of the sites, if you heard testimony are unsuitable. We would just recommend to the members of the General Assembly and everybody involved in the oyster fisheries, time, energy, and resources are really better focused on man or war shoals. It's right in front of us. It's been vetted by all the agencies up and down the food chain. And we're now pretending we didn't go that far on just that one resource. So, you know, it, we just look at this as a distraction and we hope everybody can stay focused on the core mission. And again, not to overstate it, but this fat set that we've just experienced, which is the best since 1985, imagine if there was more clean shell on the bottom and how many more oysters would be around, not just for the public fishery and harvesting, but for all their ecological value. So we're missing a really golden opportunity. Why the resistance against the public fishery? Leave the public fishery alone and let's all together go get more shell. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And next, uh, Captain Rob Newberry. Rob, uh, welcome back. Rob? Oh, there he is. No, no cuts about the sweatshirt this time. I, I, would, <laughs> I, I would never do that again. I know you would. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Captain Rob Newberry, Chairman of Delmarva Fisheries. Um, yeah, D DFA has to object to this, and, and for many reasons, is that um, I was contacted by all members of our associations on the shore here, and uh, none of them knew anything about this. They weren't contacted about these areas. And the specific thing I've heard from everybody is that at these specific meetings, there was only 12 spots that we came out with, not 27. So where did the other 15 or 16 or whatever come from? And questions that had to be asked about this. Okay, is this going to be going through the per same permitting process as uh, Man of War Shoals? Uh, what are we going to consider about the bore sites? What about the, uh, as that Dr. Colden said, with the uh, ESA, the Endangered Species Act, that's got to be done. All this has already been done for Man of War Shoals. So, I mean, it's cleared every federal government agency. Uh, the proof is of what we can do. And over the 40 year period, I mean, I'm tired of hearing that it was a failure. I mean, I'm still looking at this report from the comptroller's office at 59 million bushels of oysters were generated and $73 million in revenue. I don't think the comptroller is going to lie about what that program did. So, I mean, we are on a good number for 4,000, 400,000 bushels plus this year in the harvest. That's my estimate. And uh, yes, we do need to get more shell, but I mean, we've got one focus and that's man of war shoals. So Delmarva Fisheries and our association vote for or ask for an unfavorable on this and just focus on man of war. I thank you very much. All right. Um, are there any questions from the committee? Well, seeing none, thank you, uh, everybody. We'll, that ends the public hearing on that bill and we'll proceed to House Bill 601. Again, Delegate Jacobs. Bear with me one minute. Sure, no problem. Sorry about that delay, Mr. Chairman, had changed topics. I think having Larry Jennings and Chip McLeod on the same side of a bill is enough to throw us all off. Well, isn't it? I think it's a you made a good point that uh, where uh, Clean Chesapeake and and uh, and uh, uh, Delmarva Fisheries were on the same side as Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, CCA and uh, and I think that speaks of volumes by itself. But all that being said, Mr. Chairman, I'd like okay. to uh, I'd like to move on to the Chesapeake Bay Coastal. Sport Fish and sure. License Recreational Bill, HB 601. Um, yep. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. That wrong paper there. 
Uh, currently, there are, est there are an estimated 750,000 recreational fishermen and women and fisherwomen in Maryland. The data on catch, disposition, et cetera, is very, very limited. MRIP is the state regional federal partnership method for collecting data, which is now most widely used. There are a couple of methods in place, such as Fishing Effort Survey, or FES, which is a mail survey sent to the households of those who registered as saltwater anglers. The second conducted by NOAA is the Access Point Angler Intercept Survey, APIS, which is a dockside intercept survey at random locations across the state to cal calculate catch rates. I per personally witnessed this method last summer and it, is a and it is a voluntary survey. The Department of Natural Resources also has an online volunteer site for reporting recreational catch. And then in the category of striped bass on that uh, voluntary site, the report or is as follows. In 2014, there were 86 trips reported. 2015, 67 port, uh, uh, trips reported. 2016, 70 trips reported. 2017, 74. 2018, 133. And the most current information, 2019 reports 106 trips. So as you can see, these are very low numbers based on an estimated 750,000 uh, member recreational fishery. There have been substantial changes in both the quota, quotas for striped bass and the season closures for striped bass that would have had much more accurate data in determining these important changes uh, if we'd had better reporting in place. And as you know, I've put a bill in uh, 2014 and also 2020 asking DNR to, to improve this, this reporting process. Um, in the, and that legislation was passed both years in, in 2014 and 2020, requiring the department to, to conduct a study of obtaining more accurate harvest data for recreational striped bass fishery. Uh, the reports were sent to the committee, to the governor, to EHE, and, but there were really no substantial changes made in the reporting process. That's what brought this bill to the surface. This bill seeks to establish Chesapeake Bay and Coastal Sport Fishing License Pilot Program to collect certain recreational fishing information and improve compliance with certain registration requirements. It also establishes a task force on recreational fishing data collection and licensing to study and develop multi-year plans for improving the collection and quality of certain recreational fishing data. The members of the task force are listed in the bill and the secretary of uh, DNR shall designate the chair of the task force and, the, and also provide staff for this task force as well. Currently, the Department of Natural Resources offers a consolidated Chesapeake Bay and coastal sports boat license, which allows everyone on board the vessel to use for pleasure to fish on the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries and state waters in the Atlantic Ocean uh, in lieu of individual license. And that's sort of like when you guys go out on a boat like mine and you don't have to purchase a license, it's covered under that sticker, so to speak. However, these individuals must register with a the department. Uh, there are approximately 50,000 boat fishing licenses like this sold in each year in Maryland. Of them, 20% or so of the anglers fishing under this boat license are complying with the free registration requirements, which I wasn't aware of, Mr. Chairman, that you, were, you should have reported <laughs> that you were fishing for free. <laughs> How about that? So anyhow, we're, we're gonna improve that. But to improve accounting uh, for participants in recreational fisheries, this pilot program should help in closing the compliance issue and the knowledge gap. So uh, I think all of that being said, Mr. Chairman, this is a bill to, to improve the reporting requirements for recreational catch in Maryland, which is a very important part of uh, the data necessary to make good decisions, good science. And with that, I, I thank you and ask for a favorable vote. Uh, first up testifying in favor of the bill, Robert T. Brown, followed by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. How about that? 
That's oh, can, you hear me? <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, this is Robert T. Brown, president of the Maryland Waterman's Association, chair and members of this uh, committee. Uh, I'd like to see a favorable on this. Uh, the commercial fishery, we held at a, the highest standard that there is anywhere in the United States on our reporting on our rock fish. We got to tag each fish. We got to weigh them and have them to a check-in station to hold nine yards. And we understand that something like that would be almost impossible for to do for the uh, sports fishing industry like that. However, what they have now is not working and we're not getting the data that we need on this reporting. And these rock fish is cherished by all of us who live on this bay. Uh, I will say this, there's, at this time, there's no shortage of rock fish on the bay as I can see. And I'd like to have a favorable on this. And thank you very much. I made it short and sweet. <laughs> yes, you, yes, you did. Uh, next up, Al, uh, Dr. Allison Colden with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Again, for the record, Allison Colden, Chesapeake Bay Foundation here in support of House Bill 601. As I mentioned previously this afternoon, um, striped bass is one of those fish that is in need of conservation and one of the most important recreational fish species in the Chesapeake Bay. And although this bill is not specific to striped bass, it does incorporate some key recommendations from a striped bass recreational fishery harvest study, which was um, a bill uh, sponsored by Delegate Jacobs and passed several years ago where DNR uh, identified some key knowledge gaps in recreational fisheries data collection and recommendations for improving recreational fisheries data. And these types of data are key for improving recreational fisheries management. Um, the coastwide management uh, data collection system, the Marine Recreational Information Program, while it works well at a coastwide level when it is used as it has been in the past at the state level and even on a season level, that data is inadequate to produce some of the management options uh, and management recommendations that the Department of Natural Resources would sometimes like to implement. So this bill would address the, um, the coastal fishing license or the boat license uh, and try to improve compliance with the free registration that is required for anglers fishing under the boat license, as well as create a task force to address some of the additional recreational data gaps, which we believe is a good first step into investigating and implementing some of the key recommendations from the striped bass recreational harvest data report. I believe that Coastal Conservation Association Maryland will be um, suggesting some amendments to correct the name of the referenced license in the legislation. And I just wanted to flag that we would be in support of those amendments to ensure that we're referencing the correct type of license in this legislation. We urge your favorable report. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Let's go next to David Sikorsky of the CCA. David, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, my name is David Sikorsky, the Executive Director of CCA Maryland. Uh, other hats I wear include the uh, Chair of the Sport Fisheries Advisory Commission to Maryland DNR. Uh, was also, I'm also an, a participant in the Oyster Advisory Commission. Uh, but back to fish, I'm honored to uh, be the proxy for Delegate Dana Stein at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, a seat I actually share with Dr. Colden. So I get a front row seat of fisheries management nearly every day. And um, when I was first appointed to the Sport Fish Advisory Commission in 2009, I immediately noticed the challenges with recreational fishing data. And since then have been talking about this and CCA has been talking about this and working towards improved recreational fishing data uh, because good data equals good science. Good science means we can conserve our resources for the benefit of all. And that is squarely where the mission of CCA lies uh, to conserve, promote and enhance our marine resources for the benefit of the general public. So I was proud to bring these concepts and these ideas and work with Delegate Jacobs uh, to develop not only a task force where stakeholders and academic partners can work with DNR to identify ways to better survey recreational anglers, again, the general public. Um, and, and then we can ultimately turn that into good science to manage our resource for the future because that impacts all users of the resource, even those in the commercial fishery. Uh, the recreational harvest and effort going into that harvest is a major driver in understanding our fish stocks. And so good data means, means good fishing. Um, and so ultimately all, all our amendments are um, is to clarify that it is for that boat license that's been mentioned, the $50 boat license. Um, many of us have been non-compliant with the free registration, um, and there's many ways to tackle that. But this pilot program is one way to do that, 
and the task force would ultimately empower uh, people like me and, and other stakeholders from around this state to provide DNR actual actionable things that we want to see happen. And we are more than willing to support as volunteers and folks that are uh, angling out there on the Chesapeake Bay and beyond. So we can have healthy resources for the future and ensure access and opportunity for all anglers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, any questions for any for the sponsor or any of these? Uh, yeah, uh, Delegate Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, right now, a uh, a recreational fisher could go down to the bay and get on a boat, and the boat captain or the owner has a license, and you can and I could fish underneath that license, right? Yes. And are you saying that that's a problem? No, it's a, on our written testimony, I highlighted directly from the Maryland DNR website, the specific license we're talking about. So one individual purchases it for their private vessel. That individual has a license that wherever they go to fish in Maryland waters, in tidal waters, that's their personal license. Their boat receives a decal. That decal stands as a license. And anybody that fishes on that boat, just simply by current regulation, has to, for free, register, just so we can count what we call the universe of anglers, how many people are out there. That's a very important thing. And that way, when we do a survey, like the MRIP program, we actually have a database of people to tap and ask certain questions, which are deemed necessary by statisticians and the scientists. So it's not... The licenses are, are good. Um, another key part of a license is that it is special fund revenue to manage the Department of Natural Resources budget. Um, and so it's the license is all a good thing. We just need to improve the compliance gap. Um, as Delegate Jacobs said, recent DNR data would show that uh, about 50,000 of these stickers, these boat licenses are sold to individuals so they can then take others fishing on their private boat. But we have Who's, about uh... 10 to 12,000 people following through with the registration at this point. Whose responsibility is it now? Is it, would it be the, the recreational tourists, so to speak, to register or the one with the license to report how, how many and who under current procedures? So it would be ideal that the, those who purchase the $50 boat sticker are informed and can then inform the individuals that fish with them that they need the free registration. But ultimately I would, argue that it is the responsibility of the individual to understand the regulations before participating in fishing. And ultimately that comes back to the kind of the crux of the problem is that most people don't know this exists. And so um, ideally this pilot program would, would solidify um, the need and, and, and trigger some, some actions by DNR to better inform the public. You know, there's lots of different ways to do that, but, but from a management and a science perspective, what's really key is that we know who's out there. Are, are there any um, ship captains licensed signed up for this hearing now? Uh, that's it. I mean, that's um, uh, also signed up and uh, writing in favor. Susan Zellers with the Marine Trades Association and uh, David Sutherland with uh, Hardcore Logistics, which I'm not familiar with. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If, if I could say a couple things here. Um, Go ahead. The uh, charter boat captains and and reporting is different. That's that's uh that's handled. That reporting is already pretty comprehensive. Actually, it's uh I had the numbers here in front of me, but uh, something like uh, eleven thousand trips were reported this past year with some seventy seven thousand participants, and that's the EFAC system and. and uh, that was put into place a couple years ago, and they're under a, a, a pretty robust reporting requirement. The big part that doesn't require really in, much of anything is the recreational side, the seven estimated 750,000, which that number came from DNR. There's very little data there. And when you're making uh, real important fishery decisions on quotas and closures and things of that nature, I think that the science needs to be as accurate as it can be. And I've been talking about this for a long time, uh, you know, that, that importance of it. And one more point, and before uh, Dave says something, Mr. Chairman, I did want to point out uh, in the, yeah, in the go bill, ahead. Under, under the uh, 
representatives on the task force. I intentionally, I intentionally made sure there were no legislators on that task force because it is an election year, and I know that's been problematic uh, having having uh, legislators that during an election year on a task force. So take a look at that membership. Okay, well, we we appreciate your concern for for all of us. So, okay. Any you, more man. questions or comments from the sponsor? Seeing none, okay, thank you very much. Uh, that ends the public hearing on House Bill 601. Let's go to House Bill 595. Delegate Mangione, are you in the house? Yes, can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Yeah, I can see you and hear you. You've okay. got four minutes. The timer will cycle through two minutes, two times. Okay, great. Well, I'll just try to be as quick as possible. Here I am with HB 595. It's a Senate cross file from uh, my senator, Senator West. And uh, before I get started on what the bill does, I'll just let everybody know last year, this was in the form of uh, Senate Bill 446, which passed the Senate unanimously and uh, following some technical amendments, passed the House 136 to zero. And this is uh, after the amendments were done. Um, this is basically the new bill. So just letting everybody know that. Uh, the background HB 595 as follows, when businesses or institutions or individuals take action that are found to be in violation of the state's environmental laws, they typically face a penalty or a fine. For example, fiscal year 2019, the Maryland Department of the Environment initiated nearly 10,000 enforcement actions, resulting in over 5.5 million in administrative or civil penalties. But while these monetary penalties may deter future environmental violations, they don't directly address the harm to the state's environment caused by the particular infractions. And what happens with Maryland law currently, it provides that instead of paying fines or penalties, environmental violators can engage in what are known as supplemental environmental projects uh, or SEPs. An SEP is an environmental beneficial project that a defendant subject to an enforcement action voluntarily agrees to undertake as part of a settlement of the action of which the defendant is otherwise not legally required to perform. Um, some examples of SCPs include uh, planting trees in the neighborhood where the violation occurred, providing funding for environmental projects, installing high performance air filtration systems in schools, uh, and so on. There's plenty more of those. Um, in fiscal 2019, the uh, Department of Environment, it entered into three SCPs with a total value of over $3.5 million. The previous year, MDE entered into five SCPs with a total value of six million. So what this bill will do, it requires MDE to create and maintain a database of SEPs that the department may consider for implementation as part of a settlement of an enforcement action. So it requires also the department to prioritize the selection of an SCP located in the same geographic area as the alleged violation and to ensure that the scope and cost of a chosen project meet certain criteria and generally relating to a supplemental environment projects database. So um, basically SEPs result of course in a much more improved environment where the violation occurred rather than nearly just paying money into the state treasury. And uh, I appreciate the committee's consideration, HB 595. We'll be happy to answer any questions on this uh, fairly straightforward bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, this passed the house and the Senate last year, did it run out of time or something? I believe the House, my understanding, made some amendments, and that's why uh -huh. it, it ran out of time. And uh, okay. Wes asked me when I spoke with him. And yeah, he he informed me that the this bill is basically last year's bill with the amendments. Okay, understood. There's nobody else signed up to testify in favor. Nobody's opposed. Any questions? Well, there you go. There okay, go. you're free to go. Uh, Thank Gary, you, Mr. Joni. Thanks, okay. member. Bye bye. Thank you. All right, next we have Delegate Love and Boyce who are presenting um, the subject of some of a lot of work this uh, interim, the Conservation Finance Act. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Delegate Love first and then Delegate Boyce in that order. Sarah, you're up. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chair. Actually, can we flip the order please? Yes. No. Yes, of course. Well, thank you so much. So um, yes, I'll take uh, half the time and then I'll uh, pass it off to my uh, colleague um, who will then pass it off to our panel. So thank you, Mr. Chair, um, for the consideration. 
I am, for the record, Regina T. Boyce presenting HB 653 alongside my colleague, Sarah Love. HB 653 creates the framework to leverage public-private partnerships and investment to bolster Maryland in meeting its ongoing climate change and climate resilience initiatives, specifically focusing on improving water quality. Improvements in water quality advances public health and environmental justice, creating processes that ensure clean, safe, and affordable water for every resident in Maryland. By defining new terms like blue and green infrastructure or expanding options for our loan programs or expanding uses for others, while at the same time creating full access of and ease to participants in carbon markets for private ownership, HB 653 makes it possible to meet the required demands that climate change has made on government to do something now to protect tomorrow. Conservation finance can be defined as the stewardship, protection, and restoration of natural and the environmental services. It's the allowed practice of raising and managing capital to support environmental conservation. The subject matter usually includes topics like forestry, agricultural, natural resources, clean water, and waterways and open space. And you'll hear a lot of that through my colleague's testimony. Conservation financing, while new to us in Maryland, is not new to the United States. The earliest form of the practice goes back to the creation of the Boston Common in 1634, when townspeople of Boston, Puritans, voted to tax each household six shillings for the purchase of a 44 acre farm to be used as a community common. The newly established common served a combination of public, military, agricultural, and recreational purposes. This purchase is the first example of self-governing people taxing themselves to purchase open space for establishing public and private benefits. The Boston Common is the oldest public park in U.S. history. Thank you. Um, colleagues, and I will pass it on to Delegate Love. Well, wow. and thanks for that history moment. Go Thank ahead. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Delegate Boyce. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Delegate Boyce gave you the overview of the bill. I'm going to give you the closer in view. Um, you have a lot more information in your files, so I'm just going to run through some things pretty quickly. Uh, specifically, the bill amends the agricultural, the agriculture, environment, natural resources, and procurement articles to do a whole number of things. Help landowners participate in carbon markets. Um, it asks the Environmental Justice Commission to make recommendations to MDE that would make progress towards safe, clean, and affordable water. Improve water infrastructure by expanding water quality loan and financing projects for things like lead pipe replacement direct financing to remo removal of hazardous dams or retrofit old dams for small-scale hydropower, define green and blue infrastructure, making Maryland the first state to define blue infrastructure, establish the Green and Blue Infrastructure Advisory Committee to advise officials on how to facilitate the scale and pace of green and blue infrastructure projects, identify overlaps between state and local procedures for climate solutions that could be simplified. The bill also would allow MDE to provide loans for the protections of source water areas through property acquisition or easements, protect forests and rivers by allowing state and private landowners to work together on paying for reforesta reforestation and afforestation. Um, it enables Maryland to buy environmental outcomes in the Susquehanna River Basin, so long as they provide environmental outcomes in Maryland. It adds green and blue infrastructure projects to the P3 law. It puts pay for success contracts in the procurement code, which will shift the risk in contracts and ensure contractors are only paid when projects deliver the outcomes established in the contract. And it creates a temporary task force to focus um, and look at new federal, federal accounting standards and make recommendations on ways to use natural assets to create equity and climate resilience in disadvantaged communities. I know that's a lot. There's a lot of information in your files. We have one amendment from um, MES that the Delegate Boyce and I are sponsoring. Um, and with that, I'll kick it to our panel. Thank you. Yeah, let me, first of all, let me thank uh, both of you, Delegate uh, Love and Boyce, for doing so much work with uh, others on this bill. To refresh everybody's memory, this was a bill that came uh, over from the Senate last year. There was no House cross file. 
Uh, it's complicated and we've never seen it before. And because we never had a, a House bill, we didn't have a proper public hearing. And for that reason, the vice chair and I talked about this and we weren't comfortable just going with the bill uh, just because, you know, when, when we didn't have a proper public hearing on something that says unique and new as this is. So we we just uh, didn't do anything with it. And now here we are. And thank you, Delegate Love and Voice. So uh, let me recognize Tyler Abbott with um, MDE. Welcome back to the committee, Tyler. You have two minutes. Mr. Chairman, I if I'm correct, I believe uh, Secretary Ben Grumbles might be oh. here in this place. Well, it's better yet. Ben, welcome <laughs> back. Uh, not necessarily better yet. Tyler does a good job. Can you hear me okay? Well, I can hear you. Um, we can't see you, though. Ah, oh, there we that's go. Even yes, better. I, we can see you and oh. hear you now. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, uh, Chairman Stein, for your leadership on natural carbon sequestration and uh, delegate uh, love and voice. Uh, this uh, legislation uh, marries uh, in the areas of greatest priority for all of us, I believe, and that is Chesapeake Bay, climate action, and environmental justice. And it does it in a way that brings us all together because together we can uh, get further and uh, reach our goals. It's, it's a financing mechanism that uh, will put Maryland as a true leader around the country I want to thank all the participants who have been working on this. Um, Governor Hogan on October 1 wrote to the speaker and to the president of the Senate and identified uh, three or four uh, legislative environmental priorities for the General Assembly session. And this was the first one he listed, the, the uh, Conservation Finance Act. It supplements, it supplements the public funding and builds partnerships and accountability. And I'm very proud of the fact that uh, EPIC and uh, Chesapeake Conservancy and others involved in this are putting a greater emphasis as well on environmental justice and on the blue and green infrastructure that's going to help our state uh, be a real leader and be a, 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 a success story for Chesapeake Bay restoration and carbon sequestration and using the pay for performance model, which has been proven to be such a good model through the Chesapeake and Atlantic uh, and Coastal Bays Trust Fund and also the Clean Water Commerce Act that, that is a broad consensus-based approach. So uh, everything about this comprehensive legislation is a positive step forward that's going to help uh, finance our climate and Chesapeake and environmental justice ambition and I look forward to any questions you or other members of the committee might have. Um, okay, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Uh, always good to see you. Let me next go to Nicholas Dilks, who's with uh, Ecosystem Inv Investment Partners. Uh, Mr. Dilks, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Great, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Chairman Barbe and, and the committee. Uh, my name is Nick Dilks. I'm the, one of the founders and the managing partner of Ecosystem Investment Partners. We're a firm based here in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, in 2007, we started this firm uh, to secure private investment capital from investors all around the world, focused solely on environmental conservation and restoration investment. Since the founding of the firm, um, we've invested over a half a billion dollars in large scale restoration projects around the country. Um, we've been able to restore over 220 miles of degraded streams, over 46,000 acres of wetlands. And here in Maryland, uh, where we've recently gotten very active, uh, we've successfully restored over 27 miles of streams and reduced over 6,000 pounds of uh, pollution into the Chesapeake Bay through water quality offset projects. The bill uh, 653 recognizes the role of private investment in being part of the solution set. We're very proud of that. And what it really allows for is uh, for the acceleration of various public programs to really only pay for actual results of environmental conservation and restoration rather than well-intentioned efforts. By authorizing pay for success as a competitive procurement practice, the Conservation Finance Act creates the opportunity for the state to buy completed environmental outcomes if it so chooses. 
With that, firms like ours, and there are many firms like ours, will expand our investing into the delivery of things like water quality improvements, environmental conservation, carbon sequestration, and others. Types of restoration projects that are enabled by this type of procurement will do both to increase local jobs and increase the health of Chesapeake Bay and other natural resources. And that's a really rare win-win proposition in today's environment. There's also strong evidence through projects that we've done and others have done here in Maryland that using pay for success contracts, in fact, reduces the cost of environmental restoration to the public and to the taxpayers without reducing any of the quality and only accelerating the timing which those projects are put on the ground. In addition, the legislation encourages the formation of public and private partnerships to aggregate projects for carbon markets and offset sales. If you uh, could start to wrap up your testimony, yep, the committee will, would appreciate it. Absolutely. This will reduce barriers for Maryland landers to participate. So in conclusion, um, with all of the effort focused on restoring the Chesapeake Bay, uh, the Conservation Finance Act will allow us to accelerate that work, to bring in private investment capital, and firms like ours look forward to um, participating in that and helping bring that forward. So we offer our full support and swift passage of the, uh, the Conservation Finance Act. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Welcoming back to the committee, a good friend, John Griffith. Uh, John, welcome back to the committee. You got two minutes like everyone else. Unfortunately, I do not believe he's here. Well, that that's a unfortunate. OK, how about Kim Coble? Kim? Thank, yes. To? Oh, there she is. OK. Thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Kim Coble. I'm the executive director of the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. I'm coming before you today to ask your support for HB 653, the Conservation Act. And I also want to thank Vice Chair Stein um, for pulling together the work group, which I served on um, to go over this bill and, and get it in the perfect shape that it's in. Um, we have submitted written testimony a lot, and it's been signed by a number of organizations. And I just want to make one point to you before I let you go. Um, you know, we've worked with you over the years to pass legislation that funds environmental improvements. Uh, for those of us that are old timers, you might remember the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Fund that funds point source and non-point source protection. We passed the Atlantic and Chesapeake Bay Trust Fund that funds local governments and helps them make, meet environmental outcomes. And we have cost share programs for agriculture, all oriented towards meeting environmental outcomes laudable work. Those are all funded through state uh, dollars. And what this bill does is it gives us the opportunity to leverage private funds, probably in the realm of hundreds of millions of dollars each year coming into Maryland and having that private sector invest in Maryland to help us achieve environmental outcomes. It's the right bill at the right time, and we urge your um, favorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next, we're going to turn to who? Um, Michelle Dietz with the Nature Con Conservancy. Good afternoon, Chairman Barbe, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today in support of House Bill 653. For the record, my name is Michelle Dietz. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Maryland DC chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Maryland is a national leader when it comes to investing in clean water and climate change solutions. And this bill builds on that progress and takes the next steps to scale solutions for greater environmental impacts. I'd like to highlight just two important aspects of this bill in my verbal testimony. So first, this bill makes Maryland's environmental investments more efficient and effective. It does so by authorizing Maryland state agencies to use pay for success contracting. The Nature Conservancy recently engaged in a pilot of this type of contracting with MDOT to reduce stormwater pollution. Although a relatively small project, the partnership helped MDOT save $9 million or 75% of what a traditional approach would have cost. This bill expands the opportunity to use this type of contracting to multiple Maryland agencies engaged in environmental restoration and protection. And second, the bill codifies nature as infrastructure. We know nature plays a critical role in cleaning our water, our air, and combating climate change. And yet, despite providing these benefits to our communities, we don't finance natural infrastructure in the same way as traditional gray infrastructure. This bill changes this by defining natural infrastructure in code, enabling the state to finance investments in nature in the same way as gray infrastructure and seeking to better understand and incentivize the capability of nature to store carbon on land and in our waters. Together, these changes can create opportunities to realize impactful and equitable investments in nature across Maryland's communities. 
For these reasons, the Nature Conservancy urges a favorable report on House Bill 653. Thank you for your time and consideration. Well, thank you. And let me now recognize Jeffrey Eckel. Jeffrey, welcome to the committee. Thank you, sir. Chair and Vice Chair and committee members of the House, thank you for the opportunity today to testify in support of the Conservation Finance Act. I represent Annapolis-based Hannon Armstrong, a company investing almost $2 billion annually in climate solutions. While we have invested approximately 50 million in ecological restoration projects, this is too small for the problem at hand and only a fraction of the resources we can bring to bear to address the problems in the Chesapeake Bay. I would like to highlight how I see the Conservation Finance Act, Act working here in Maryland and how I've seen it work in other markets in which Hannon Armstrong invests. By authorizing the CFA, the state will be able to buy completed projects that have larger, more impactful environmental outcomes and, and that could deliver faster compared to merely relying on appropriations. This kind of pay for success program is analogous to the incredibly successful example of energy service performance contracts, otherwise known as ESPCs, which is a 30 year old framework to scale energy efficiency investment for the US government. ESPCs enabled a historic collaboration uh, between the US government and the top engineering firms to reduce energy use of the US government. It allows an agency to use private capital and guaranteed performance to finance, engineer, build, and operate projects the agency actually needs. With over $10 billion invested to date, ESPCs save the US Treasury in money, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and create jobs in all 50 states. Similar successes have been achieved with programs run by virtually every state in the country, including Maryland. With the Conservation Finance Act's use of pay for success measures, Maryland will become a leader in the country in attracting private investment for ecological restoration projects. In closing, we urge a favorable report on this bill to advance Maryland's leadership on ecological restoration. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. Uh, Mr. Eckel, uh, before I go on to um, anybody else, uh, clearly you have my sense of humor. I'm looking at your office. Is that the photograph of Richard oh, yes. Nixon giving yes. Elvis Presley the award yes. for uh, fighting drug addiction? Yes, um, it's, a, <laughs> it's a constant reminder of how rapid the fall from grace can be. <laughs> okay, um, is, um, is uh, John Griffin, uh, has he joined us? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Yes, Mr. Chairman, sorry, That's I was okay. on the wrong Zoom account. Uh, uh oh. I'll be brief. Okay. Uh, Chair Barbe, Vice Chair Stein, and members of this esteemed committee, I'm John Griffin, and I have been and still am the program manager for what's called the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership, which is a baywide landscape collaborative that promotes conservation and restoration of valuable lands in the watershed. We want to commend uh, Chair Barbe, Vice Chair Stein, and the lead sponsors, Delegates Boyce and Love, and your colleagues from Appropriations for establishing the work group after last session to develop this excellent proposal, which uh, was, as you all know, uh, cross-filed in the Senate, the very same bill as another testimony to the great work uh, of all of you and many others who are on the work group. Um, <clears throat> you might be interested to know that this bill is really a culmination of three years worth of effort uh, that we started back in April of 2019 with a round table on private capital investment with a great cross section of government, nonprofit, private investors, private restoration companies. And we have spent the last, since that time, with work groups and lots of consultation with state agencies. And um, so we're thrilled uh, that. Uh, this bill is now being heard and we urge a favorable report. I might add that my colleague in this last three years, Tim Mail, is unfortunately out of town, mm -hmm. but he sends his uh, best wishes and hopes that you will uh, provide a favorable report. Thank you all very much. Yeah, I, I didn't give enough of a, a shout out to the vice chairman of the committee. Uh, as if he didn't have enough work to do, I kind of put him put this on him. And 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 again, I want to compliment delegates Boyce and Love for the terrific work, along with our colleagues and appropriations and all the other folks who are 
uh, helping uh, on this whole effort. So we do have a question from Delegate, a couple of questions. The first is from Delegate Ruth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, this is complicated, so so you have to forgive me if I stumble around my question a little bit to um, to get to exactly what I'm trying to ask. Um, so so there's a lot of good stuff in this bill. It's um, clearly a lot of work been put into it, um, and I appreciate uh, you know a, a lot of the things that are in it. I I am concerned about the the P3 aspect of it because I think that there are um, there is a belief that P3s are a more effective use of state dollars than direct appropriations. And I, I don't think that that's always true. Um, for example, we see the, the purple line as an example of how P3s can go awry. There can be um, a lot of problems. And so um, I'm just interested in hearing, and, and I hear there's a pay for su success aspect to this, which I think is probably part of the answer, but um, I don't know if that would be in place for all of the private, you know, P3 partnership aspects in this. And I'm just interested in hearing how we can ensure that these P3s would be an effective use of state dollars. If, if I could delegate Ruth. Sure. Um, in uh, over 250 of these investments we've made, the fact that private capital is coming in uh, means we are bearing the risk of performance. What, uh, a governmental entity like the state of Maryland needs to do is to make sure that um, uh, uh, Nick Dilks's company and my company are on the hook, not the state. If it if there's cost overruns, if it doesn't work, that can't be the problem of the state. And that has been some of the issues with the P3. Um, it's uh, the model. It's it's uh, structuring it to make the private sector bear the risk as well as the return is essential. Thank, thank you. So all of the P3s under this would be under that pay for success model then? Is that the- That's my understanding. That's the no, plan. No. Um, no. And so I guess, you know, the, the other concern I have is when you're dealing with, with private investment, then the state government has less control over how those, those dollars are spent. Um, and so, so how do we ensure, <laughs> for example, um, you know, adequate labor protections for for these kinds of contracts. Yes, uh, um, Delia, go ahead. I think an important understanding, uh, Mr. Eckel, is, is exactly right, that the, the notion of the pay for success while you're engaging the private sector is really one of the keys. Um, again, when the state or other entities are only paying for outcomes, you uh, assure the fact that they're not paying for efforts that may have failed. And I think to your last question, it's entirely up to uh, the agencies or the buyers, if you will, of environmental outcomes to set the standards. So you can set standards in terms of um, the quality of the environmental restoration, the location, uh, the need to address uh, environmental justice issues in those bids, uh, which are also competitively bid by companies. And so we then are held accountable to meeting those standards or we are not compensated. So I think that's um, one of the aspects of the pay for success program that allows you to get the assurance that you're going to meet all of those standards that you're seeking. Could I just add in on, on behalf sure. of state government, as, at least the Maryland Department of the Environment, we, we have never viewed this notion, this bill as giving, giving up control over how dollars are spent, public dollars are spent. It, in fact, when you go to a pay for success procurement approach, uh, you have even more control over what the private sector is doing because they only get paid for the pounds that they deliver in, in uh, nutrient reduction or carbon sequestration. So I, I don't view this as, a, as much a P3 up or down bill. What it is, is it's a let's broaden the funding coming in and, the, uh, and, and leverage through these pay for success procurement models, which are very promising. And, and there, are, there are mechanisms throughout this bill that ensure uh, compliance, monitoring, and uh, just and verification, verification that the pounds that are being paid for uh, were actually were reduced and, and uh, taken away from the bay or, or uh, sequestered in, in the context of carbon. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I really, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, and and so, are there um, 
labor protections built in or would it be anticipated that, that there would be some kind of labor protections required um, prevailing wage or something to ensure that companies aren't cutting costs on the back of the workers? I, can, can I quickly answer that? I think sure. again, once that contract has gone out to bid for a project for the investment, those are the things that we can say on our end um, of what we want and how we want it. And so we could include, or I would say we should include those standards. And so again, this is not, I think to the secretary's point um, and Mr. Echo's point, it's not a kind of a, we put out this bid and then it's, once we put it out, then these people pay for it and then that's just it. No, we have, we set the parameters to begin with before we actually put this up, if that makes sense. So it's like, we're setting up, we're setting up what we want to happen in Maryland. And then there's going to be an investor that says, hey, that looks like something I want to get into. Okay. Th thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. Okay. Before I recognize Delegate Clark, I have to say this, the failure of the Purple Line has more to do with local community opposition that succeeded in delaying the project for over 20 years and probably tripling its cost as a result of that delay. Uh, I, I'm not saying that I'm a gigantic fan of P3s, but that's not the reason the Purple Line failed. Uh, has, I guess it hasn't conclusively failed yet, but anyway, uh, Delegate Clark is next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh one of you gentlemen could maybe educate me a little bit. Uh, my question is, you know, I'm a simple, I was always a simple retail person. I'd buy a product, sell a product, reap the, uh, the profit on a project, on, a, on, a, on an item. Um, if, with private investment, and in, in you talking about paid for success, how, how, do you, how, how do we as a state reimburse for the private investor, uh, their money plus, are, are you just getting carbon credits and uh, it, uh, soil uh, carbon cr uh, credits or something? How, how does, the, does the, the profit margin on the private investment, how's it calculated and, and, and what's the parameters for something? If I could answer that, Dylan Clark, it's a great question. You cut right to the chase of the matter, which is um, using your retail sales uh, background. If I go to a store and I want to buy a toaster that works, um, I'm willing to pay for a toaster that I can plug in the wall that works. Right. What I don't want to do is hire a consultant necessarily to tell me how to build my own toaster and then pay that consultant along the way. And then at the end of that project, find out the toaster doesn't work, but I've already paid for all the good meeting effort. Pay for success is exactly that. If we can't generate a pound of reduction or an actual ton of carbon sequestered, we never get paid. So we only are paid if the project actually works and it can be verified and, and um, uh, to the satisfaction of the buyer. And so kind of using that analogy again, um, if the price of the toaster is at or below what you think is fair or what other toasters cost that work, uh, then you're a willing buyer. Um, and so if we can't deliver a pound of nitrogen reduction from a stream restoration project or a ton of carbon for a price that's at or below what the public is paying already, then we're not in business. We cannot sell to you. In fact, one of the things we found in projects like this across the country we've done elsewhere is that when you engage the private sector and we can uh, bring in the efficiencies of the things we do, oftentimes that price fully delivered, fully working is oftentimes below what the public has been paying in the past just because um, of the efficiencies we can bring in. So I think it, in fact, a great analogy of only paying for something when it's completed and when it works. And again, if we can have a profit margin under that price, then it's a win-win for everybody. Okay, so in other words, you bid the bid, uh, is my assumption that you bid the project at a certain cost or for the, the specs on the contract. And if you produce the outcome, uh, how, how, but how do you figure over and above your cost? How do you figure the profit margin in for your outcome? How, how does the state, is, is that all done in the initial contract? 
Well, most of these are competitively bid. So okay. companies like us, uh, like Mr. Eccles, there'll be multiple companies that will bid on that project and, and deliver the lowest price. It can also be value bid, but um, so that's, that's one way to figure in, I would say, what the, what the price is. And again, under the contract, the, the uh, agency only pays if they elect to go that route, um, if the price is acceptable and if it's fully delivered. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah I, I'll talk to the sponsors of the bill a little bit more and sure. get my head around them a little bit better. Thank you. for And, and by the way, my product always worked. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> They'll have to tell you That's what it good. is. Yeah. <laughs> Alcohol, <you>. right. Uh, <laughs> um, Delegate Healy has the next question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and, and thank you. Uh, Delegate Clark a- asked part of what I'm interested in focusing on, and that is, um, I mean, our experience with P3, and I agree with, with the chairman about all the problems with the purple line, but one of the issues that happened is that you have all these ditches that are t- have torn up the roads in two counties, and uh, you can't just leave it like that. So, <laughs> so um, you know, getting it to the point where it's deliverable is great, but what happens if two things, how, how how is this working in other places? Are you actually able to get companies to bid on something where they only get paid for what they finally produce? I, I work in a different field. Usually if you provide a service, you provided the service and then you get paid. So I understand that. But what happens if your company goes bankrupt or you partners walk away in the middle of the project and the project's not completed? But it's partially done and there's like, and sometimes what's done is the part that is torn up and, and it's not finished. What, what, how did the state get protected from that kind of scenario? If I may, uh, there's typically performance bonds, which mm-hmm. are a standard way to, uh, to guarantee performance. And then fundamentally, uh, we as the investor in the transaction has lost money. Um, if there isn't performance, we're the ones bearing that risk. Performance bond should help uh, remediate a site if it's not, uh, uh, if, it, if it's half done. The performance bond is the answer then, um, because if, if you take the loss and then you don't have a company anymore because it just destroyed your company because you risked too much, um, what happens then? You're correct. You have the, the bond. Yeah. The, yeah. The Financial bond. assurances and performance bonds are a key piece. Another piece is that most of these environmental restoration projects also require environmental permitting of their own. So you can't just go start restoring a stream and, as you say, make a mess of it. You have to get an Army Corps and MDE permit. And so we, as the provider, have to also go through a very rigorous permitting process where those agencies also have to confirm our financial ability to deliver the project. And as you said, not um, stop halfway through or something like that. Thank you very much. All right, next question goes to Delegate Terraza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Okay, a couple of questions. Were you suggesting um, that when you do things in a P3, that they cost less to the state or the county or the, they cost less? Is that what you were saying? In our experience, in most cases, they, they can. Uh, if they don't cost at or below what this agency is paying already, again, per unit, per pound of nitrogen or per acre of wetland restoration, then we really have no business in, in bringing that to the table. So we've actually found cost savings to the customer generally through the efficiencies of working through pay-for-success contracts, yes. Okay. And I think one of the biggest reasons, for, excuse me, is um, you can do larger projects um, now projects are done with annual appropriations and they're relatively small and there are very strong economies of scale in these kinds of projects that if they're more ambitious and larger, uh, it has absolutely been the case in, uh, in the U.S. government that energy efficiency projects that are $100 million are um, more cost effective than 10 times $10 million projects. It's absolutely, economies of scale is what drives uh, a lot of that uh, uh, lower cost. Would you, and maybe this is in your testimony, I apologize if it is, but if you have a couple examples of those, I'd love to see them. 
it's just very different than the regular P3 model where it turns out costing four or five times the amount that the original project count the cost. So, if I could just emphasize the, the, the example, the model here is the Clean Water Commerce Act, which I mean, that's one of the best examples where we are using a portion of the Bay Restoration Fund for uh, pay for performance, pay for pounds reduced. Uh, I don't describe it as a P3. I describe it as a contract where the state is paying for the entity that can deliver the most reductions in nitrogen and phosphorus and I, I just I view I don't view this glass as half empty I view it as more than half full with a great emphasis on ecosystem restoration which the Nature Conservancy highlighted as this is where as a state we really need to be focusing because it delivers not just water quality benefits but carbon sequestration climate benefits as well so I, I uh but I, I think the examples of the Clean Water Commerce Act and, and some of the pay for success uh, projects that have uh, been uh, funded by Department of Natural Resources are, are some examples we can provide you with as yeah, well. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I, I'm, okay. I'm thrilled to hear it's, it works very okay. differently than the P3 model um, generally does. And if you could just give us a couple of specific examples, not of the programs, but of the actual projects that have been completed. Mm -hmm. I think in the financing. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, Delegate Weivel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just trying to understand parts of this bill. I know it's rather complex, but on page seven, it talks about a water infrastructure asset, and basically it's talking about the, the removal or repair of that asset. Mainly, it looks like it's focusing on removal. So, um, I'm assuming the intent of all this is to promote potentially green energy, but it sounds like we're almost putting the importance on the passage of fish over uh, green energy through the use of hydroelectric power. Could somebody explain the language to me on that page seven? And maybe you can do it later. Uh, as far as what exactly we're trying to do there with hydroelectric power. And then it talks about 30 megawatts or less. I don't know why 30 megawatts, why that number is, is an important one. Uh, but if someone could explain later the details of that language, I would appreciate it. Um, and then secondly, my, I have a question regarding um, reforestation. So I know in our county, you can do payments in lieu of reforestation on site and our soil conservation does an excellent job in taking those funds and identifying projects to protect streams and different waterways. Does this bill at all impact what the locals are able to do with their funding currently? Anyone? The, the, yeah. uh, the, the way I understand it is that um, we, we don't want to create double dipping, but we want to create an expansion. So if um, if there's an ability to get a uh, for that local person to get some carbon market um, credits, but let's say the locals have something else, but not necessarily credits, but they're getting credits for some other soil conservation um, uh credits or grants or something like that, they would be able to take advantage, as I understand it, of multiple um, different um, programs, but not necessarily double dip on, um, I get carbon sequestration from the federal government, but then at the local uh, area, it's a different project, but then I can get something from there. So it allows for multiple, um, the owner can get uh, multiple resources, but not from the same space. And it's, I'm incorrect in saying so. Someone um, please correct me. Uh, on that question, I, I was referring mainly to when it's talking about the water quality fund and then it, it adds language for reforestation for replenishment of that and use of those funds. So I was concerned okay. that the legislation is gonna take the money away from the locals. Cause I think right now th they're doing a really good job in implementing a lot of this reforestation, it, 
is this take that money and then put it into the state pot, which then allocates it out, or or the local programs? Oh, I'm be- sorry, I understand what you're saying. You're you're asking if if in doing this project we would then kind of reserve all that money and then reap. Yeah, some- does it usurp yeah. what the locals are doing now? I I do not believe so, but at all. Uh, yeah. I- Go ahead, John. I was just going to say, uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, okay. John Griffin speaking again. Okay. I can answer your first question now, or I can follow up with you. Uh, on, it's up to the, the chair. Yeah, we're uh, you know running late. Um, if sure, uh, if you want to follow up with an email later, sure. I'd um, be happy to. Delegate. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Right. Okay, next question goes to uh, who? To Delegate Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was listening to the testimony from the gentleman from uh, Echo System Investments, and one of the things that was mentioned was permitting uh, prior to construction. And one of the problems that we experienced with this, with the P3 process we were encountering is the design build process where the designing was going on simultaneously with permitting, which ultimately caused tremendous amounts of headaches and hiccups. Does this piece of legislation address that some kind of way? And what is that, what is that, uh, that, that kill switch or workaround for that design build process? Wait, 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 you know, you're applying for permits while you're designing. So this, there's got to be a circumvention there some kind of way. Mr. Who'd Mr. like Chair? to answer that? I, I can, I think. Okay. If that's okay. John Griffin again. I think there, there's a bit of confusion here about the one section of this bill that broadens the PEEP 3 authority under the transportation statute for MDOT because they wanted to have some ability to also build into P3's blue and green infrastructure restoration. But that's distinct from pay for success contracting. So I know there's, that seems to be a uh, understandably confused point here, but pay for success contracting is not a P3. And uh, just to emphasize that, they may have some similarities, but they're distinct and they're distinct in this legislation. And again, the only place where uh, P3 is, is even comes up is in the transportation uh, section with one amendment that the Maryland Department of Transportation asked for. I don't know if that helps or not. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll follow up later. Sure. Okay. Uh, Delegate Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. So, um, first of all, I'm a little concerned about just kind of the community input and democratic accountability part of this bill. Uh, you know, one thing that's come up in the context of particular, you know, recent P3 projects in the state is, is the, you know, the idea that the executive branch can enter into a contract for a public-private partnership and that with, you know, limited or questionable amounts of input from a community that the projects would essentially be, you know, done to or done around or, you know, are there, is there anything in the bill to ensure that uh, communities, you know, so let's say, you know, on the Chesapeake Bay before some sort of water, water restoration project is pursued, that communities will have some sort of input into the process. And I guess this question is for anyone on the panel. I, I, I'd be happy to answer it. This is John Griffin again. Uh, again, this is most, most of what we're talking about here are not P3s. That's limited to the Department of Transportation. But any of these restoration projects normally lead, need uh, MDE permits right. and Corps of Engineer permits. And through that process, they have to post them. They have to have opportunities for public input and hearings. That's so, right. Uh, ben, you may want to elaborate on that. I, the, all the questions about P3s, I don't think um, I continue to agree that this is not about a three P, uh, P3 bill. It's about um, pay for success, contracting, and there's nothing in this bill that removes any public input opportunities, the need for public involvement and awareness when uh, state funds are being used for projects. I mean, I, I, I MDE, I, I don't think this is, I, I, well, actually what I do see is that this bill in a, in a significant way 
through the the, uh, the work group that was established, they, they have added a lot of additional uh, uh, provisions to get greater input, particularly in disadvantaged communities to, to respond to needs from, from lead pipe replacement to um, ecosystem restoration in areas that, that really the public is demanding more action, more fun, more uh, more projects. So I don't see anything in this legislation that would reduce or negatively impact our uh, public engagement requirements that are under current law. Okay, I appreciate that. And, and if you guys could, I have just one more question, Mr. Chair, if I could. Uh, I know we're running long with this hearing, but um, I'll be quick. Just help me through the math here, and just you know, feel free to treat me like a sixth grader. Um, you know, if let's say, let's use the, the, you know, let's talk about pay for success, obviously not, you know, not P3, we're on pay for success. And let's say that MDE could do a stream restoration project for, I don't know, let's say a hundred dollars. Now, obviously we're using six grade numbers here and it would cost, um, you know, some sort of, you know, private contractor or, you know, whoever the same amount. Now, obviously, in order for private capital to flow into the project, there would need to be some sort of return on investment. Um, and so the state would presumably have to pay more than the $100 million to ensure that some sort of profit is turned if the actual cost of completing the work is indeed $100. So let's say the state indeed instead pays $110 for the project. Am I, am I understanding correctly that essentially the state would pay a little bit more than it otherwise would would for a project for two reasons. One, because of the risk associated with overruns, and two, because of the unlikelihood that the state actually would put up this large amount of money that we need to complete all these projects. Or am I just completely way off base, which judging by the shaking of heads, I assume I am. So can someone walk me through this? I offer. Sure. Uh, it's a very good question, and like I was saying before, uh, I think the the key assumption that I would uh, that is the underpinning of all this is that it would cost the private sector the same amount per project, or say a hundred dollars per foot of stream restoration, than the public agency. The only way this works is if uh, it costs us, let's say, eighty dollars, and we are able to do that because of what uh, Mr. Eckel said is the efficiency of we do larger projects. Uh, we can do more um, creative things in terms of working with landowners. Uh, all those efficiencies come into our projects. And so if it costs us less than that, and then we sell that outcome only if it's successful to MDE for $99, right? That, that's how it really works. Uh, I don't see many examples, if any, that work where we would sell for more than what the agency is doing themselves. That yeah. effectively, and again, all this... Uh, provision is, is, is allowing agencies to consider those types of contracts. Uh, it doesn't require them to take a bid if it's more than what they want to spend, but it allows them to get access to that efficiency and actually take delivery and hopefully pay less, honestly. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's very helpful. And thank you for speaking yep. in my, my sixth grade number term. No so, so I guess my question is, so I guess the hope is the private sector will be more efficient. The private sector will do this more cheaply. A hundred dollar project um, would be would cost instead to cost the state eighty dollars plus they wouldn't necessarily bear as much risk they wouldn't have to come up with the capital obviously we have a budget surplus now we don't always have a budget surplus um, my my final question is is there anything in the bill that um, would ensure that the state would not be on the hook for say one hundred and twenty dollars if something went wrong with the project yeah yeah the contract price. Hey. Uh, As in here. Yeah, go, I mean, I, I think the answer is the contract price, right? Well, right. You, uh, Delegate Bond, in your questions, you asked about cost overruns and a pay for success contract. There are no cost overruns. Yeah. The right. companies, the investors bear the risk of delivery, right. successful delivery. Um, <clears throat> number one. Number two, um, I think from my experience uh, in this field the last several years, uh, just about any of the projects that I've been familiar with, the private companies and their investors uh, end up with prices very competitive as compared to the norm with other projects done by others. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, it just, uh, I don't know, did I miss part of your question? There? No, no, y'all have done a great job. No one missed anything. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that helps a lot. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I guess, you know, I, I hope if these efficiencies do exist in the private sector, I hope that maybe some of y'all, you private sector people will call up some of our state agencies and give them some tips on how we can keep <laughs> costs down in regular government projects. But yeah, no, I appreciate y'all's time. Thank you. But before I recognize um, delegates Terraza and Ruth, let me see if I can summarize all of this, because uh, in the 10 years prior to my being elected, I spent a lot of time in uh, federal government contracting, and I was a contracts and proposal manager for a number of Beltway bandits in Gaithersburg, Maryland. So so my, my imp when I had to get a subcontractor for a NASA job or for an Air Force job, typically what we would do is if the prime contractor was not able to do what had to be done because they lacked the expertise, they, I would authorize them to go out and get a subcontractor for a specific thing, whether it's some aspect of satellite construction or you know something like that. So in my view, as a contracting officer, it, this isn't just about price. Sometimes you don't have the expertise and you have to go to a contractor or a subcontractor to be able to get the expertise. And in this contracting regimen, it seems to me that what I'm doing is I'm saying I need to remediate some uh, some project, there's a remediation project of some sort, and we have to get rid of 1,000 pounds of some sort of pollutant. And so we will pay you at a price of $800 per pound or whatever it is to do it. And, and we're going to sit in judgment of whether or not you deliver on with respect to the 800 pounds. And we're going to sit in judgment as to whether or not you do a good job. Otherwise, there's going to be some liquidated, I mean, you're not going to be paid or there's going to be a liquidated damage in, in the case of, you know, if you do a bad job of it, instead of getting $800 per, per pound for one segment of the work, you may only get $200 per pound if the contract is written like that. Is, is that, is that, is that an accurate way of viewing what these arrangements would be? Somebody needs to unmute and either agree or disagree with me. I'll agree that's mostly yeah. correct, yes. And I would okay. add another part of it, which is actually critical a lot of these contracts, is oftentimes before a, um, a competitive bid is offered for the private sector to deliver this remediation, there's generally a re uh, request for qualifications round that goes first, where yeah. the private firms have to demonstrate their experience, their track record, their financial ability to do the projects. And only then are they allowed to even then bid on the projects that the agency may want to have put out there. So. Right. So it's like any other uh, contracting situation where you get the lowest qualified bidder. It's not just whoever has the lowest number. Correct. Okay. Uh, for the last two questions, Gel Delegate Terraza and Ruth in that order. Delegate Terraza. Sorry, I realized I wasn't off mute. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm still having trouble a little bit with this, a couple of things here, economies of scale. I guess I'm trying to understand if the state is doing many of these projects across the state, how do you have more, how does the contractor have more of an economy of scale such that you get from using the elementary school numbers that um, Delegate Stewart wanted to use, you get from that 100 to 80, um, but enough so that you can take on both the risk and you have a margin of um, enough margin to make money off the contract. And that's what I'm trying to understand is where is that like where is your economy of scale that the state doesn't have for many the many projects that we're doing across the state? I may delegate for us that the um, uh, the governor, the limitation for the state implementing these projects, is the amount of annual appropriations. What we're able to do in this kind of a um, arrangement is we can look to future state revenues and monetize those and give uh, Nick Bilks' company all the capital he needs in year one 
to get a much larger project done. You get a economies of scale with the size, but you also get the project done faster. And time is money uh, in these kinds of construction projects. Yeah, and I, of, yeah uh, I understand the time frame because I understand why the P3 is so attract. I understand we're not talking about P3, which I'll ask in a second, a second question, but, but what I don't understand is the economy of scale piece. <clears throat> Yeah, if I could, if I could answer that too, I'm sorry for doing so much talking. Sure, John. Great question, um, uh, Doug Atraza. The example would be, um, yes, the agencies are doing good projects. They're doing lots of generally smaller projects, and they're oftentimes limited by what Mr. Eccles said, is that they are forced to do smaller projects every year because that's only funding that's available to them. When a company like us is asked to do 17 miles of stream restoration, let's say, that the state says we'll pay for that over the next decade, we can go ahead and cobble together as we did in Cecil County last year, 17 different farms who are all willing participants. And when we go do that restoration project, we mobilize once. Uh, we get much better prices for moving dirt, planting trees, moving rocks, all the things that you have to do to restore. The pricing that we get by doing a single large project versus say 20 small projects over time is the economy of scale. It's, it's how uh, bigger projects generally without sacrificing any quality, uh, can get better prices because they're not sort of start, stop, start, stop type projects. It's just a different way of operating. So, okay, so then when and how do you get paid? Like that still has to be appropriated at some point. Correct, so as, as we demonstrate the success of that stream restoration project over say a 10 year period after we've actually done the restoration and the state goes out and monitors that project every year, confirms that the actual restoration is worked, the reductions are happening, the contract stipulates payments, say, over a decade for work that we did in the first year. Okay. Okay. Uh, Delegate Ruth gets the last question, and then we're going to move on to the last bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate the, the second bite at the apple. This has been a great discussion, and I, I really appreciate all the, the ins and outs, and I'm really starting to come to a better understanding of it. Um, and, and so I understand the, the costs to the state are, are limited by the, the pay for success and, you know, the contract um, and um, that, that the, the contractor takes the risk um, and that economies of scale are how the costs can um, be saved. And, and I understand what you're say, saying about the, the state doing small projects, but couldn't the state do get the same economies of scale by appropriating a larger amount and doing multiple projects together. I mean, it's just the way we do appropriations, right? I, it's a great question. The way I've addressed that with uh, the Office of Management Budget in, in DC is the most economical thing um, is for the US government or the state of Maryland to issue debt or use its capital and do the biggest projects possible as quickly as possible. The reality is it doesn't happen. Uh, you don't, and so as a taxpayer in Maryland, yes, appropriate all the money we need to, uh, to do bay uh, restoration and cleanup. That is the best, most economic solution. Practically speaking, it just simply doesn't happen. Okay, thank you. And, and so I understand that there are you know, parameters built into these contracts of, of what success would be. Um, but the, the companies, because you're, you're limited by the contract in, in terms of the amount that you receive, um, and you also want to hopefully be able to make, make some profit, what, um, what, how do we know that there won't be, like, suppose the economies of scale don't save as much as you anticipate, and it's going to, to cost the company more than, than the contract price to do that. Um, how do we know that, that the companies won't cut corners in maybe in areas that aren't specified in those success parameters so they, they wouldn't really be measured in the outcome of the, the contract? Do you understand what I'm trying to ask? Absolutely. So like any investment strategy, we accept the risk of taking a loss. That's, that's investing. We hopefully don't, but we accept that risk. As Jeff said, we have to post performance bonds. So if we decide we, we can't even do that, then there is a financial assurance that would step in and finish the project. And then finally, we are required to get permits from MDE, the Army Corps, other agencies uh, that make sure we can't cut corners. There is no way that we can do a stream restoration subpar, if you will, because it's very specific as to what's been permitted 
And if you don't meet those requirements, then um, we have you know other ramifications that come in, like the financial assurance that make up for that. And to add on that, if we're the investor in the uh, in the project, we're going to make sure that Next Firm doesn't cut corners because we're the ones that are bearing the risk that the project won't get paid. So they're they're a more more than uh, just the uh, state of Maryland worried about um, successful projects. Yeah, and let me just say that whether it's a company or a government doing a job or subcontracting a job, all of this depends upon proper management and co proper contract management. You can't, the government doesn't, you know, government agencies cut corners also. And so the way you stop that is either by having proper management of government agencies, or in this case, proper contracting management of, of the people who you hire. And so with that, I suppose I get the last word. Thank you to everybody who's worked on this. And thank you to everybody who's testified. And that will conclude the public hearing on this bill. We will now proceed to the last bill of the afternoon, House Bill 673. Delegate Hartman, welcome back to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I start, I would just like to update Delegate Celeberti. Because of, <laughs> uh, because of Zoom, I've been in three committees today. I'm not out of breath, so I'm canceling my gym membership. <laughs> I know you've had a long day, and I'm going to make this brief. It's um, Thank you, uh, Chair Barbie, once again, uh, Vice Chair Stein, members of the uh, Environment and Transportation Committee, for the record, Delegate Wayne Hartman, presenting House Bill 673. House Bill 673 is land use agritourism, changing the definition. The bill alters the definition of agritourism to include special events and occasions conducted on a farm. Right now, if you look at agritourism, it includes farm tours, hay rides, corn mazes, seasonal penning farms, farm museums, guest farms, pumpkin patches, pick your own, educational things, classes related to agricultural products or skills, and picnic and, and party facilities. This bill will add to it special events and occasions conducted on a farm that generates income from agricultural activity. So in other words, their special events couldn't be the exclusive income source for the, for the farm. Agritourism allows members of the general public to engage for recreational entertainment or educational purposes to enjoy rural activities. The beautiful serene setting of our farms offers the perfect venue for special events. Agritourism continues to grow in popularity as well as the demand for outdoor venues is increasing as well. It's a way for agriculturalists to diversify business, attract more customers and remain sustainable. The addition of special events in agritourism most likely will lead to additional out-of-state tourism, out-of-state tourists, I should say. The bill requires that there be agricultural use still in operation, as I explained earlier, and this is enabling legislation, not a mandate on any county. For some multi-generation farms, this can make the difference to keep the farm sustainable for future generations and protect the farm from development. The Worcester County Office of Tourism strongly supports this bill. There are others here to testify as well. I urge you, the, you the members of the ENT committee to give a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first up, Kevin Addix, welcome back to the committee. You have two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Kevin Addix with Grow and Fortify, representing value-added agriculture and agritourism in the state. Um, as we've talked before in the committee, agritourism is incredibly important to rural Maryland, giving farms new viability through direct engagement with customers. And, and that's become so very important, especially in rural Maryland. It's important to note, as the delegate said, that this, this uh, statute that we're talking about here is a guide. It's not a mandate that individual counties allow any specific activities. It's simply enabling it's a guide. It's more of a model, noting that um, these various activities are seen generally as acceptable uh, as agritourism in other states and now in Maryland. And I'll finish by saying that I, I serve on the Maryland Tourism Coalition Board and you should see a letter of support in uh, in the file for them. So I urge your support for HB 673. Thank you. Thank you. Let's next go to Colby Ferguson. Uh, Colby, welcome back. You got two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau. Um, same same thing, I can just say ditto. Uh, we we wanna see um, 
this just similar to the same uh, bill we had in uh, Delegate Clark's bill earlier. Uh, this one focuses on the special event side. Uh, several counties have already added this in, but uh, just enabling language to kind of show that the state uh, definition includes this. And I do like how Delegate uh, Hartman talked about how these are accessory uses to a working farm. These aren't the primary focus of the farm. Uh, these are to help accentuate and help the farm be uh, more profitable and, and bring in diversified uh, income. So with that, we would ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Uh, next, Ari Plot uh, with the T Tourism Council. Ari? Uh, they are not signed up for Old Testament. Eh? Oh, they're not? Oh, okay. You're right. Pardon me. Uh, I guess that's it. That's everybody who wants to testify. Um, okay, we have a bunch of questions. The first one goes to Delegate uh, Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Delegate Hartman, I mean, it's always good to see value-added uh, business for, for farm operations. Could you give some kind of an example of a special event? Could be a retirement party or something. The agritourism limits the number of people, so we're not talking about huge special event venues. It just adds in addition to hay rides and all the other things I outlined, special event celebrations, such as maybe a, a tent or something on the farm and inviting, um, you know, a bunch of folks out for an anniversary party or some kind of special occasion festivity. But, but the, uh, the, the number that's under current law uh, still, it stays in place. So it can't be more people than what's under current legislation, right? That is absolutely correct. Yes. Thank you. Okay, next question goes to Delegate Healy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question, I, I just read the uh, testimony from the person who is opposed to this, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond by asking about uh, how you, since there's no limit on the number of the special events that can be held, how do you keep it from over, overcoming and becoming like the money maker on the farm instead of the actual farming, and um, you know you end up having a venue rather than just an occasional thing. Well, first of all, it's enabling legislation. So if the county would adopt it, they could they could put parameters on it. The um, the other thing is that that you know the the bill mandates. I understand what you're saying as far as um, an agricultural use already in place to prevent it from being just an event venue. So it's meant to coincide, but, um, you know, I think the individual counties, um, you know, could put those parameters on the bill. Okay, I mean, we, we've seen bills in here before about having wedding receptions and allowing other things to go on. So I'm, I'm just curious as how this matches with that. It's, it is special events. Um, I would think a, a, a wedding venue could be included in that. The um, okay, you know, it, it would be up to the individual counties to um, to control, you know, as far as the frequency or, or, or seasonality. I, I think, first of all, with with it being a, a, a farm setting, it would be seasonal in nature um, because you're you're utilizing the buildings that are there, um, so they wouldn't have the um, you know the heat and so forth. So I think there'd be seasonality just by its nature. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, next question goes to uh, Delegate Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So under the uh, language of this bill, it talks about special events and, occasion and occasions conducted on a farm that generates income. And in the list up until now, it doesn't mention generating income, but that's always sort of been assumed. We're not crossing any new line here, are we? I don't believe um, it, it changes anything as far as uh, when I read the bill and the, the uses of it, it um, only one um, had a specification as, as picnic and party offered in conjunction with any agritourism activity. Um, this this clearly stipulates um, on a farm that generates special events and, and occasions conducted on a farm that generates income from an agricultural activity. So it's very specific um, for this particular use. Well, lots of agritourism already 
has income, right? Sure, agritourism, that's the, the purpose of it. This bill is saying that for agritourism to include special events, it has to have agricultural use. So it can't provide, you know, have a proto stand to be considered as generating income unless it has agricultural purpose, maybe raising that um, produce that is selling or something. It has to have an, a, a very true agricultural use in order to have this, this um, be allowed. And under... Um... Under this bill, oh, okay. So what we have in law already is a list, and it, you know, it says agritourism includes these things. And and Kevin, you you are kind of saying this maybe when you were talking. Are are we looking at that as a list? I mean, like more and more as like a specific list of allowable actions, or is it still just a or? Do you see it as a list that sort of includes like these types of things are going to be allowed? It, we're, we're, we're looking at it and just historically the way that this has been interpreted is it's, it's a list of what can be allowed. Counties could, of course, um, pass something different, include different things in their local definition. But these the, the items on this list. Um, it actually came from a committee that involved uh, the Department of Agriculture and Farmers a number of years ago. And when they surveyed other states, these items that are on this list um, are generally seen as far as uh, agritourism operations elsewhere. But you know, we always like to say um, that, as has been mentioned a few times, this simply is enabling, it, it's not directing um, counties in any way. And a county could or could not adopt anything on this list, um, could prohibit things on this list, could you know, potentially adopt things that are not on this list. And of course, you know, everything with agritourism, at least in our experience, working with local jurisdictions, trying to get businesses open, you first have to be on agriculturally zoned property. You second have to be an active farm and only then can you go to the county, request the use for agritourism, um, and the county at that point can put any kind of limits or restrictions on frequency, you know, size, scale, those types of things, which, which happens regularly in local jurisdictions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Delegate Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, interesting uh, two bills today on agritourism. So I have a question that may or may not have any any uh, bear, you know, a relationship or nexus with this bill. But I was just curious where wineries fall um, within agritourism. Are they in some different part of the land use article? Um, and I, I asked that for two obvious reasons. There are wineries in, you know, in, in mostly rural areas, I think, and a growing number. But also they they also have a lot of special events, you know, weddings and parties and other things. And I assume have to have some balance between their underlying source of income as a, as a winery. And I'm talking about wineries where they're actually growing the grapes um, and then and then special events um, where I imagine they raise quite a bit of money. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to answer that question as well. Um, also representing wineries, brewer, breweries, and distilleries in the state. Um, Delegate, thank you for the question. So um, there is in land use code a separate definition for farm alcohol producer, which includes you know, a whole uh, list of, of kind of parameters and, and uh, defines what the state from the land use perspective believes are the meets and bounds of what a winery actually is. Um, to answer your question about, about whether wineries are considered agritourism, in some counties, they are considered agritourism entities. In other counties, they are not considered agritourism entities. But in every case with wineries, for example, and with most uh, agritourism enterprises, there is a special exception or there's some kind of uh, review process with the county where county inspectors and agencies are looking at all the parameters of the farm, where you're siting your building, where if there's going to be parking, where will they be parking? How many cars can you accommodate? Um, how close are neighbors? Um, and you know that, that could impact the frequency of events. So wineries are generally um, treated as something else in uh, uh, most local codes and they have their own definition at the state level as well. Interesting, thank you very much.
Mr. Chairman, you are muted. Well, that's not helpful. Uh, there appear to be no further questions for the sponsor, and that would conclude the public hearing for this bill and the public hearing for this afternoon. Announcements. Mr. Chair. Uh, sure. Who is that who said that? Brooke. Sorry. Brooke. Brooke. Okay. Um, the Land Use and Ethics Subcommittee will be meeting tomorrow at noon. All righty. Who else? Uh, Delegate Healy. You're muted. And you're, you're you're muted. All right. How's that? Is that better? That's better. Okay. Uh, yeah, the local government subcommittee will have a meeting uh, on one local bill tomorrow, uh, immediately following the bill hearings. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. The Environment Subcommittee will meet at 415. Okay. Uh, who else? Anybody else? Does anybody else have an announcement for the good of the order? Okay, we leadership will meet. Oh, Marvin, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, just before you mention leadership, I just want to remind uh, you and some of the others that we are jointly assigned to judiciary. Oh. Uh, and that I understand uh, that that hearing is probably going to take place in about five or so minutes. And as I looked at the list of testimony, there are 39 persons listed. I'm just advising you of the list of persons testifying for that. Hearing. Okay, D Dana, how long is your subcommittee going to be, do you think? Um, we'll be done by 4.45. Okay, well, I'm going to have leadership at 5 o'clock. Marvin, if you have to play hooky, play hooky. Uh, we're going to meet as a leadership group at 5 o'clock. Okay. All right. Good hearing, folks. Take care. See you tomorrow on the floor.